గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ ఎవరిబడి ఆన్ బిహాఫ్ ఆఫ్ నార్త్ అమెరికన్ తెలుగు అసోసియేషన్ సో వీఆర్ హ్యావింగ్ దిస్ వెబినార్ కోవిడ్ నైన్టీన్ నవ్ అండ్ ఫ్యూచర్ ఐఎమ్ గోయింగ్ టు వెల్కమ్ వెల్కమింగ్ ఎమినెంట్ పీపుల్ హియర్ ఇంక్లూడింగ్ డాక్టర్ ప్రేమన్న నాటా చైర్మన్ ఎమరటస్ అండ్ డాక్టర్ నాగేశ్వర్ రెడ్డి గారు డాక్టర్ వరప్రసాద్ రెడ్డి గారు డాక్టర్ తల్వాడ్ గారు అండ్ డాక్టర్ కిరణ్ పటేల్ గారు అండ్ డాక్టర్ ప్రసాద్ జయరెడ్డి గారు అండ్ డాక్టర్ ఆశేష్ రెడ్డి గారు నాటా అడ్వైజరీ కౌన్సిల్ మెంబర్ అండ్ నాటా చైర్మన్ డాక్టర్ మోహన్ మల్ల గారు అండ్ ఆల్సో ఆర్పీ ప్రెసిడెంట్ డాక్టర్ సురేష్ రెడ్డి గారు అండ్ అవర్ నాటా ఎగ్జిక్యూటివ్ టీమ్ ఆల్ రామ్ రెడ్డి గారు నాటా సెక్రటరీ అండ్ నాటా ట్రెజరర్ నారాయణ రెడ్డి గారు అండ్ సుబ్బారెడ్డి గారు అనదర్ నాటా లీడర్ and we are going to have this excellent webinar and with this eminent people and they are going to enlighten us with a lot of information what's going on in the world so thank you everybody and dr ashish reddy garu can you take over from here as a moderator okay okay yeah i'll be happy to i i didn't i have not uh, sorry to... dr kavita reddy garu i forgot to mention your name sorry about that yeah i think she is our rising star in this group um anyway at the, thank you ragava Th- thank you very much uh, thank you all this distinguished speakers and uh, unless i don't need to give a lot of introduction especially for prem he is a eminent uh, person but i was under the impression that you were going to introduce prem but anyway i'll do the best i can without uh, preparation he is a good friend of ours for the last uh, 30 years and he is a very prolific entrepreneur philanthropist and he is uh, actually his son in law one time i heard him say that uh, uh, prem is like uh, you know the spanish expression mi casa es su casa that means you my house is your house like that kind of host he is so he is a very very successful entrepreneur philanthropist and he is one of the 50 most influential physicians in the usa and uh, and then he is uh, he is down to earth and any time we can reach him and we can he is uh, always willing to help so he is also last but not the least he is a cardiologist he is a physician so he can talk in the physician perspective as well as as well as a administrative perspective as well as entrepreneurial pers- perspective so he agreed to stay agree to speak and also he is agree to stay the whole meeting so with uh, with further delay i want to go ahead and turn it over to dr prem reddy <clears throat> thank you adi um good morning to everybody in india and uh, good afternoon for those in uh, almost good evening i would say in uh, most of the east coast uh my time here is pacific time is 6:10 uh i'm asked to speak for only 10 minutes so uh i'll try um to limit and i have my watch in front of me and if i exceed you could stop me <laughs> so um these are uh, uh you know unprecedented times um you know in our lifetime we haven't seen a pandemic of this nature and the whole world is fighting one enemy surprisingly the enemy is invisible okay and you could probably see only in
beat. Um, the best we could hope for is end of the year because they're hastening the processes of uh, trial in humans um, as opposed to it takes you know, almost a year, a year and a half before it comes to human trials. But um, now um, so many uh, uh, <clears throat> trials and so many uh, companies getting scientists and companies that are getting involved. Hopefully we will have uh, um, new discoveries uh, with regards to therapy and ultimately with regards to vaccine and maybe more than one vaccine because the strains might change. So uh, this enemy is still with us. We haven't made, uh, uh, I think you are, the, the slides are going faster than what I'm talking. Could you control the slides and go back to the one, first slide? Uh, okay, that's it. That's the first slide. Uh, my name is the first slide, but it doesn't matter. I've been introduced. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Just stay there. Stay there. But on the left side, I mean, on my right side, are the statistics. But with the pictures, um, others can't see the statistics. So... I'm ready. How are we going to deal with that? I mean, could you uh, uh, blind others and leave my my picture only? Otherwise, uh, yes, yes. Part of yes. the slide won't be seen. Right, right. right. Your your picture only will be shown, no? Right. Uh, so yeah, we should be fine. Yeah, right. you, no, we, we can see the entire screen. Now? We can see. Uh, the we can screen. see everything, Anna. We can see. Oh, you could see. Yes. 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 On mine, I I can't read my own. Um, Oh, it's, okay, it's okay. Global. <laughs> okay, okay. I see myself and um, all others one after other. Oh, uh, so okay. I can't read my own slides. I, I think I could do without reading if you okay. know uh, yourself. Let me guess what it says. 8 million cases, uh, 460,000 uh, mortal deaths. U.S. is 2,200. I don't know how to translate into lakhs. Um, uh, U.S. deaths as of uh, uh, Friday, 119,000 and still counting. Uh, at this juncture, I would give some statistics uh, of my own, my own experiences. As you know, I uh, founded and I own a, a hospital management, I mean, hospital company. Uh, with 45 hospitals in 14 states. Um, my own experience is uh, uh, we have performed 45,000 tests at our hospitals, 5,300 positives for COVID-19, I mean COVID uh, 4,300 uh, patients were admitted and treated. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and we have uh, um, uh, of the primary diagnosis of COVID, 191 patients expired. That's a 12% uh, mortality, which is high. Uh, but you know, the the uh, the denominator is small because you know we didn't do that many tests. Patients that came to hospital came with symptoms at least initially. So this is not a reliable mortality rate, but uh, um, something we need to wait and see. Uh, <clears throat> the next slide, I'm ready or whoever, could you show me the next slide? Okay, uh, this is about uh, um, uh, coronavirus itself. Um, uh, it's called common cold, it's uh, single-stranded RNA, uh, first discovered in mid to the 1960s, the surface spikes of glycoprotein, otherwise I call them crowns, are the most uh, potent and most important element of this virus and its uh, uh, spread. Um, animal reservoir is mainly bats. Uh, it's a dominant reservoir, uh, but there are intermediate hosts uh, of various degrees, like um, if you go to the next slide, I think there is something more. Could you go to the next slide? Okay, so we had three kinds of um, 
uh, epidemics, not pandemics, uh, outbreaks, call it. SARS uh, in two, 202 and 203, uh, that's COVID-1. MERS, it's a Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome in uh, 12 on, and now COVID-19, uh, which is SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and that's what we are dealing with. Um, could you go next, please? Actually, my picture there looks better than in real life, so I might as well just have it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, um, it started actually in uh, 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 Wuhan, Wuhan province uh, of China, and especially in one seafood market. That's the picture of that uh, market. It's called Huanan Market. Uh, it's from New England Journal of Medicine. Um, from these, uh, um, uh, uh, from these animals, uh, the bats transmit to them, and uh, and then by either by bite because they're blood suckers, uh, or by uh, dropping species which these animals eat. You know, species uh, the, the feces have high concentration of virus. I'm sure uh, uh, Dr. Nagesh already would be. Uh, uh, talking about it. And um, so there have been several animals uh, uh, throughout. Uh, SARS-1, the main culprit, the uh, intermediary host, was called cybot cats. I guess they eat the cats um, uh, in Wuhan and in China. And the present uh, uh, intermediate host uh, is pangolin. You know, pangolin, I never saw a pangolin right, other than pictures. It's like uh, armadillo in America. It has the spikes, um, and apparently they eat the meat, it's delicacy, and also they, they use these spikes for uh, treatment, uh, like, you know, the, like the shark fin and uh, snakes and that kind of stuff. So that's how it spread there. Um, one of the important things, you know, people especially President Trump blames China for everything, calls it a China virus. Uh, but, you know, you know, whatever it started, it's now a world uh, uh, virus. We all need to deal with it. But the important uh, um, fact is the Chinese, um, the first announcement uh, came on uh, December 31st, 2019. Um, gene sequencing uh, was completed uh, very quickly by January 7th, in one week, uh, they sequenced the gene. And uh, um, uh, China shared the diagnostic test by January 10th. So within 10 days, China uh, came with the grips with the virus. And of course, they you know, put everybody on quarantine, forced separation, forced quarantine, and they were able to restrict at least to Wuhan, even though now it is spreading uh, other parts like Beijing and all that. Next slide, please. Uh, boy, it's going to take time here. Okay, uh, I'll go quickly. Uh, this is COVID uh, uh, on the left side. That's the COVID virus. And you see all those uh, um, uh, uh, spikes. Those are um, uh, the hallmark of this thing. The, the middle one is the spike. Uh, electron microscope of the spike. The right one is where that spike gets hooked onto ACE, ACE2 receptor. You see that uh, heavy blue? That's the receptor. And that's how it transmits. Okay? So every one of those spikes could uh, infect. Next uh, slide, please. Okay. This is pathophysiology and it's complicated slide. Instead of me going through very details, a couple of points I want to make. Um, the, the virus, as you see the, the, on the left hand, um, it goes through proteolysis uh, called proteolytic activation. So it separates the protein S1 and S2. And that S1 is the crown. And that gets attached to the cell membrane and that's how it spreads. Um, so the the importance of that is the treatments and vaccines are going to focus on how to block the receptor binding, how, how to increase the 
uh, I mean, prevent or minimize the proteolytic activity and, uh, and how to uh, the, prevent the fusion. So if you know the pathophysiology, you know the treatment, uh, how to go about treating. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the pandemic spread from Wuhan to Europe and to uh, all the parts of uh, the world, and you see the United States. Okay, um, uh, now it says that it mutates in the process, so that's what I mentioned earlier. Could I move on next? Let's go faster, please. Okay, uh, the COVID-19 infect infection is about 2.6 times uh, compared to 1.3 uh, of uh, common uh, flu, seasonal flu. So if you look at the five infected people uh, from common uh, cold or, or seasonal flu, uh, by five cycles, 45 people get infected, whereas five infected uh, COVID-19 uh, patients, uh, by five cycles, you have 368 uh, in fact, you see the multiplication and you see the cluster. Visually, you could see the difference between uh, seasonal flu and COVID-19. Next, please. Okay. And this is the pandemic. Uh, I took a, 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 an area uh, of, uh, uh, by the way, I don't know whether I mentioned during the talk, these slides were uh, uh, given to me by a close friend of mine from my school in Tirupati. Uh, who is a practicing physician and uh, a good friend of mine, Dr. Nanda Kumar. Um, this section takes from February, middle of February, and by March 15th. Look at the spread, how pandemic uh, it became because of this multiplication. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is United States. I don't see the spread in the United States. In the two weeks, you see the upswing there uh, in the uh, United States from, uh, uh, what, March 1st, um, actually first week of March till end of the March, it became uh, uh, you know, nationwide uh, uh, in the United States. Next, please. Okay. Um, I don't go too much into this. Okay, 45% of COVID victims are asymptomatic. The next important point is uh, pre-symptomatic transmission is uh, 45% of the cases. See, put those two things together. By the time you realize you had a contact, um, so you got infected when the, uh, the vector uh, or the infected person is asymptomatic and most peak period is on or before the symptoms start. So it's a very deceiving. Next, please. Next slide. Okay, um, diagnostic test, you know that. The, the, mo the point I want to say is that this test, uh, fluoroimmunoassay, uh, is now being done uh, in the United States hospital, in our hospitals, uh, so that within an hour you have a result, uh, and then you could do electro surgery if the result is negative. The, 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 the uh, predictability, uh, the specificity is 100%, but sensitivity is only 88%. And then most commonly done is um, PCR, uh, that's a polymerase chain reaction. Um, that's again, 100% specific, uh, but sensitivity is not uh, as, as not 100%. Okay, moving on, um, the other tests there are uh, being done is serological tests. And none of the tests that is becoming very modern, I don't know how much it has been tested, CRISPR, where they're using the technology of gene editing. You know, they edit the genes. Um, right now it is diagnostic only, but then it is going to become therapeutic uh, uh, in future with the gene editing. And uh, I don't know when that's going to be, but it's going to be sooner than later. Another test is the, the company name is Biotech Pioneer itself. The name is Biotech Pioneer. They're coming up with a strip, which is you know, uh, amazing. It's like uh, you do a pregnancy test. You, know? you pee on it and you tell whether it is uh, you're pregnant or not. The same way you dip it in, uh, um, uh, I believe in blood sample, 
and you could tell whether you have a, a COVID or not instantly. Now, I'll address a few therapies, uh, um, you know, pharmacological therapies. Uh, you, uh, you know, we're still experimenting. Uh, remdesivir is the only one that has been, next slide. Remdesivir, go on, yeah, uh, uh, is the only one that has been tested to minimize the course uh, of uh, its antiviral drug, you know that. Uh, chloroquine, highly promoted by President Trump, but it's only clinical trials at the present time, um, but not uh, prescribed uh, uh, other, in other uh, places. The other therapies is um, uh, convalescent plasma and uh, hyperimmunoglobulins, um, and uh, we, are, we are using it. Uh, our results, are, some of our hospitals have uh, uh, entered into the trial. We are using convalescent uh, plasma, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, and then you know immunomodulation therapy, which is under. Uh, um, so, if you <clears throat> look at the immunomodulators, <clears throat> you know interleukins and cytokinase. Uh, uh, this virus causes cytokinase storm, you know, and uh, that's what causes the uh, um, pathology. And so these uh, uh, immuno Modulators, uh, some of the names are here. Um, you know, and then everybody is experimenting with everything else. And I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see there's a there's a uh, pilot study of seldenafil, you know, Viagra, because it's a vasodilator, it reduces the pulmonary hypertension. So uh, that's one of the treatments. Uh, uh, and then um, the next slide, please. Uh, so, like I said, in pathophysiology, the treatments are focused on uh, addressing the pathophysiological sites, like um, ACE2 receptor uh, um, blocking the um, entry to ACE2 receptors, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 in a blocking the S protein uh, from uh, uh, attaching to uh, uh, the cell membrane by uh, inhibiting the protease, so S1 and S2 doesn't split, and, uh, <clears throat> uh, um, and human monoclonal antibodies, um, and uh, these are other drugs. Uh, you know, formatidine, uh, it's, I believe, Pepsi, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, it probably, possibly, uh, binding the protease, it inhibits the effect of protease in the intravenous dose, and I haven't done that uh, um, uh, we we were talking before the meeting. Uh, Faviparavir um, is called um, uh, Favi flu in India. Here is called uh, Avigan. Okay, so I don't know much about that. Um, no personal experience. And uh, the one I've been using for years and years, Dipirinol or Plavix, um, is supposed to be used for. It's again w works through protease um, <clears throat> and. Uh, uh, um, anti-parasite drugs like uh, chloroquine. Uh, this ivermectin um, is an anti-parasitic drug which is supposed to act uh, uh, in, the, in the water replication. Um, so my uh, next slide, please. This is uh, my last slide, and I might have taken three minutes more. Um, uh, I'm not going to go into details about this vaccine because uh, we're Prasad Reddy Garu and uh, uh, um, some, some other speakers might be talking about it. Just mentioned about the studies um, that are going on, uh, University of uh, Oxford, uh, BioNTech, Pfizer, uh, Novavax, uh, um, recombinant vaccine, and Johnson & Johnson. Um, <clears throat> um, and also recently you heard um, it's evolving, the treatments. Uh, from Oxford, you also heard treating with dexamethasone um, uh, because of the, uh, when it is intense, not early on, early on causes more harm, but when the um, pulmonary inflammation and the uh, inflammatory exodus, um, this dexamethasone decreases. This most, uh, in the last two weeks, we've been hearing about it. And like that, there are several therapies being explored, and um, and we have to wait and see. With that, um, uh, I, I stop here and to give time to others, and I will be around uh, towards the end to answer questions. And I have a lot of personal 
uh, uh, knowledge of talking to the doctors. And only one doctor died uh, who was exposed to while treating the patient. And like many doctors do, uh, he didn't come to hospital, stayed home and went on into distress and taking um, nasal oxygen, but they overwhelmed him. And, and last minute he called and came to the hospital and expired on the way. Uh, other than that, we didn't have mortality among the doctors, even though we did have in three, four about uh, frontline workers. And uh, with that, uh, uh, thank you very much. Let's move on to the next speaker. And, and uh, Adi, take on. Thank you. Thank you, Prem. Excellent job. A great overview. So the next, uh, yeah, you did a, put in a lot of work, a lot of effort, uh, Prem. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Ne next speaker is uh, Dr. Dr. Kiran Patel. So his topic is a little bit different. Actually, I, I need to go ahead and give, um, yeah, you can give the overview of the speakers. You know, unless you are sitting in a cave or something for the last five years, you would know all these speakers. They're very well-known people. Most of them are very well-known and some of them are still rising stars. So I think to be respectful to the speakers and also to the audience, I want to introduce each one at a time so that they would remember which speaker it is. So next, let me go to Dr. Karen Patel, who is uh, graciously agreed to speak. Uh, Dr. Karen Patel is a is an honor and privilege to present Dr. Karen Patel, who is a serial entrepreneur, humanitarian, and philanthropist. He was named Floridian of the Year 2018 by Florida Trend Magazine. His focus is on on health education and general education. He has built many hospitals, uh, I, I don't know exactly how many, but he has built hospitals, schools, and colleges in three continents. <coughs> okay, mute, his, his general bhumi is Africa, his, his uh, karma bhumi is America, and his matru bhumi is India. He has built two HMO plants with revenues of over $1 billion each in the United States. He has built two medical, medical colleges, 14 paramedical colleges, and a college of global sustainability. So he is well suited to give this topic, the effect of COVID-19 on education, both health and otherwise education going forward. So I'm turning over to Dr. Patel. Thank you. My good friend Prem uh, had taken a few minutes extra, so I will try <laughs> and help him by cutting my talk to five minutes. Thank you. My, my Thank views you. are going to be a little contrarian, provocative, and basically, as Prem mentioned, this invisible enemy has created a havoc globally but if i focus only on united states unfortunately we are in a era where there is significant political divisiveness we cannot trust the media in the past your source of information used to be reputed medical journals but today with internet and all you can get all kinds of information that sometimes are not verified. It's a wild, wild west. As you know, the data can be manipulated because when you look at the number of tests, the age, the comorbidity, mortality, lots of inferences can be made and we will have to wait and look at all these things six to 12 months from now. The biggest challenges we have is to find a reasonable cure and more importantly, the vaccine. And everybody is working hard and there are many good speakers who are going to cover that topic. What I want you to understand in education in this country, I can give an example of University of Kentucky has 30,000 students but 18,000 employees. These type of statistics are mostly seen in all universities. 
And I bring this up for a particular reason. And when you see universities today advertising and telling they are open and they're going to be taking students, while they show a public optimism, there is, of course, a private uncertainty. The basic rules of social distancing, etc., will be followed at this stage. I am currently in a restaurant which is overpacked and nobody is wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. And yes. things are already starting to go back to normal. And I bring this up because how can you imagine a university where there is no interaction? Uh, no interaction among students, uh, no sports. So these Zoom meetings uh, may not be a way to go, but currently in these challenging times, quite a few lessons have been continued. But when you think about medicine, where you have to deal with interaction actual live patients, humans, etc. It's only a question of time before things will be back to normal. So I am an eternally optimistic guy and I believe that while there will be some permanent changes, just like what we see at the airports, there will be in the classrooms, etc., where the distancing is practical and possible, but at other places, there'll be close interaction, especially in medical field, because you have to deal with patients face to face. The televideo and telemedicine is becoming a huge factor, and that primarily has become a factor only for one reason, and that reason is now the government is paying a physician or a provider for using that tool. Unfortunately, when you think about capitalism, if you have capitalism without ethics and morality, lots of bad things can happen. So what I'm telling you is you will see a permanent change Telemedicine, distance learning, all is coming. But I believe that it's a question of time. And within the next 6 to 12 months, especially the vaccine is available, life will go back to normal. So I will end by telling you that currently in this environment, we do not have adequate data, adequate information, and adequate results to be an authority. As you know, in the United States, they were complaining about respirators. There was no issue of respirators. They were complaining of tests that has been overcome. So you will see that many of the fears are really unnecessary. While we don't have to be overly optimistic as a society as a community we will all have to find a way of going forward and normalizing the life and i'm very very confident that over the next six months life will be back to normal i will end here and I will be excusing myself, so if there is one or two questions, I'll take it. Otherwise, there are many, many competent speakers, prominent uh, speakers that will be able to answer lots of questions with time. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to address all of you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patel. And it was certainly very provocative and uh, informative. I didn't get any questions from the audience, but is the speaker panel, is there anybody who can who has any questions for Dr. Patel? Uh, 
Okay, thank you, and I'll let you proceed because you have a great panel of speakers waiting, and hopefully I made up the time for my buddy, and you will be back on track on the routine. Thank you all. Okay, Good night. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Patel. Nice. Could I make one announcement, Adi? Sure, Could please. You, uh, somebody is talking uh, on the phone. Uh, whoever is talking and have the phone open, could they put it on mute, please? A uh, lot of people uh, are talking somewhere, maybe in India or I think, here. I think there's a restaurant where Dr. Patel is eating. Oh, that's from the restaurant. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, oh, that's all the problem. Thank you. Okay. That's what he said in the restaurant. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad with the curb. Yeah, I thought uh, I thought some kid was doing one of our. No, no, no. <laughs> the restaurant. So I'm. That's good. Yeah. So, okay, we can move forward now. We got uh, Dr. Talwar is next. Dr. Talwar is a pulmonologist, critical care specialist, and professor of medicine at Northwell School of Medicine in New York. He is also a prolific researcher, and Dr. Talwar has been living and breathing for the last three, four months. COVID-19 has been his life. I think he is probably putting like 60 to 80 hours a week. He also he has unique qualification that he is also a patient of COVID. So he has both as a doctor and as a patient, he can give his perspective. Where else could we get find a COVID-19 patient with so much knowledge as Dr. Talwar? So Dr. Talwar will be taking about the, his topic is clinical stages of COVID-19 and outpatient management. Thank you, Dr. Talwar, you can proceed. Let me see if I can share my, my screen. Yeah. Okay. 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 I'm trying to see if I can share my screen with the audience, oh, please. Okay. So yeah. Please go ahead and share. It's saying that you have disabled. Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, one second. So, Subaradi, you need to yeah, allow, yeah. allow Dr. Talwar to share. Yeah. Uh, if I could. If not, just put the other slides and I can go continue because time is of importance here. Yeah, uh, I, I'm almost done. One second. Sure. It's in the share mode. Actually, it's allowed. Okay, yeah, yeah. So now it is allowed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. yeah it, is, it is allowed, sir. Go ahead, Dr. Talwar. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we can see your screen, sir. It's very kind introduction, uh, Dr. Reddy, and uh, previous two speakers have already kind of covered and laid the, brand, the groundwork for what COVID is and how it actually affects the human race. Uh, my next seven minutes or so, I will try and put, put it into the right clinical perspective from a clinician point of view who has seen and treated these patients and also have contracted COVID and actually gotten recovered from that as well. I go back to 1965 and I will try to remind everybody that at that time, the Surgeon General, William Stewart, has made a quote, which still reverberates the books of medicine, if anybody cares to read. And it says, it is time to close the books on infectious diseases and declare the war against pestilence one. Pestilence, by way, means an endemic, or rather pandemic. Those were futuristic words at that time, but how wrong we were to think that we have conquered the world of infectious diseases. In 1980, the human mankind had to deal with the HIV infection. In 1990, drug abuse and hepatitis C and B infection. Then SARS-1 infection. In 2007, 8 and 9, MERS infection. And lo and behold, after 40, 50 years, we are back to the square one of the checkerboard because we are dealing with an infectious disease, which we thought we had conquered a long time ago. 
part of it, this has already been mentioned, so I will just steer away from things which I think clinicians and common people must understand as to why COVID-19 virus is so infective and how is it so different than the common flu and other coronaviruses. We have more than 10 coronaviruses that we are aware of, but this is the only one we are, that is deadly. It is because not only it has the spike proteins that have been mentioned before, but also troubling is the fact that this virus uses an enzyme, which is called furin, which helps to cleave the viral spike proteins and allows it then to work in, get inside the human host cells, which is the respiratory epithelium, take over, demand from the cellular DNA to reproduce more viral RNAs, and it proliferates and then it's thrown out into the body. So it is very, not only very effective, but it's very proliferative as well, which kind of explains why the infectivity is so important. And I will remind you once again, it was mentioned before, the reproductive number, an unchecked population is 2.5. It means one person will affect 2.5 unless and until protective efforts are made to, uh, to stop it. It is not only angiotensin converting enzyme, and I will come back to that because it has connotation with Indians and diabetes, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So what are the risk factors, folks? The risk factors are older age, chronic lung diseases, chronic heart diseases, hypertension, coronary artery disease, diabetes is being covered by another person in the, in the end, history of obesity, immunocompromisation, renal disease, liver disease means all chronic conditions, but I'll add two more to it today. One, we just recently found out this week that people with blood group A are more prone to this condition. That doesn't mean they have high incidence of dying from it, please, but they are more prone to it as compared to those who are blood group O. Secondly, we also know that from New York and Wuhan and Italy experience that up to in some centers, 20% of those exposed were healthcare workers. It doesn't have to be doctors, it doesn't have to be nurse, it, can, it doesn't have to be pharmacists, but those who had some connection to healthcare entity. So that is a risk factor itself. And I would urge every physician or every healthcare worker, because the surge has moved out from New York and it is right now pandering. These are, the western and the southern coast of this country, and that to some parts of India as well, from including Gujarat, Bombay, and, and Delhi, and, and even in, in, in down south as well. Please be careful uh, about it. So, so what, how do as a clinician, or how do as a, as a common man, I want to think of this disease or this virus? We know viral infections, how they infect, we are, we are very clear about it. But there is a first, a prodromal stage, even before that, you fall, before you get infected and you get it by inhalation or by touching any, any area from which you can get it. That's where comes the idea of cleanliness and, and hand washing. But initially the first stage after the prodromal first, first stage is that of fever, tiredness, fatigue, anorexia, loss of smell. And at this is the point, time when most people tend to ignore it. But if you ignore it, sometimes the fever will go away, but it will come back in the second week, which is was is co called as the immunomodulatory stage, or as, is we, as was mentioned before, the cytokine storm. The infection has occurred in the respiratory epithelium in the first stage. The virus is now, the body is trying to develop antibodies to this virus, and suddenly those antibodies and the things that body cytokines, that body releases to bind or hold the virus, end up damaging the body itself. If it damages the liver, hepatitis, if it increases LFTs, but most commonly it will damage the lung and you develop pneumonia-like features, more of it, shortness of breath, et cetera, et cetera. And if it develops the kidney, you'll have renal failure, it goes to the brain, you will have strokes, encephalopathy as well. As, as well. But most common organism are the lungs. And let me put it in the right perspective. If you look at the large population, the actual mortality of this infection is, is 1%. And by way of comparison, the actual mortality of influenza is 0.1%, so 10 times different. But as was mentioned by Dr. Eddy, in his hospital, it is around, his mortality rate is 12. And we in New York had a much higher mortality rate as well. So it depends what population you're looking at. In any area, large area, 
there will be one to 5% people may be asymptomatic carriers, means they have the virus and they are not having symptoms of shortness of breath, fatigue, tiredness, anorexia, loss of weight, et cetera, et cetera. But 80% of the rest of the population have mild disease, so we should need to calm down. Most people will get better. Another 18 9 to 19% patients will have a moderate disease that will require them to be admitted. And of these, around 10% or 1% of the entire population will need to go to the ICU because they will develop end organ damage. What do I mean by that? You will have respiratory failure requiring intubation. You will have renal failure requiring hemodialysis catheter. You may have stroke or a combination of these. So pre-symptomatic pre stage, first week of mild symptomatic stage, second week of these immune, immune modulatory stage, third week in which the patient starts to develop more further end organ damage. And now we have learned that this virus not only affects the organs per se, but it makes us more thrombogenic. So people start developing strokes, pulmonary embolism, clots in their legs, clots in the renal arteries, mesenteric ischemia, et cetera, et cetera. So this virus takes you through, through four of these stages. The fifth stage is, is the resolution and convalescence in which people get better. But I do want to point out having treated many of these patients now, that the treatment, the management of this condition doesn't stop in three, four weeks. Patients will take up to eight to 12 weeks for their tiredness, fatigue, and their anorexia, and to get better. Something that clinician must educate their patients as well. And those who <coughs> have suffered or their loved ones who have suffered from this must be aware that this will take a longer time to release, to, to, to get better. The so same thing I put it on here. Some of these things, we do see lymphopenia in there with the lymphocyte count is low, very counterintuitive. That is a poor prognostic marker. We look at chest X-ray, CT and other abnormalities, increased LFTs are also prognosticated in the sense of poor mortality. CAT scan, chest X-ray will show these changes. CAT scan may, may show these changes. They're, they're more peripheral, et cetera, et cetera. The point that I'm trying to make it, not everybody needs a chest X-ray. But those patients who are short of breath and have to need to go to the emergency room should get a chest X-ray. Bigger the infiltrates, bigger the damage to the lung, obviously bigger the, 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 the mortality. And here comes the role of steroids. Last week, Lancet uh, has put together a little article about dexamethasone study in USA, in UK, which shows that there was mortality benefit in patients who had these kind of changes that I'm showing on, on my slide and they, these patients had, did show when they were intubated or even they were requiring oxygen, high oxygen therapy, there was a mortality benefit from 40 to 23%, uh, basically telling steroids have a role in very severe disease. It has no role in mild to a form of disease or those patients who are not short of breath. So not everybody would need steroids. Again, we also use extracorporeal membrane oxygenation in many of these hospitals, in my hospitals as well. But the more we use it, we realize that this may be one of those areas of scarcity resources because this may not be available in every place, in every country, in every hospital. It does help. It helps till the time, think of it as like a dialysis machine of the lung. It helps till the time the lungs recover till, and to, so that the oxygenation of the body can continue. These patients also are at high risk for pneumothorax, lung cysts, and interstitial lung disease can develop down the line because this is one of those viruses, even when it has damaged the lung and has gone away, long-term you may develop fibrosis. I would put this in the other context. Think of the, the hepatitis virus mm -hmm. can cause cirrhosis. I thought, think of this way, this, this virus, our COVID-19 virus, which likes to invade the, the epithelial cells and the, and the endothelial cells of the lung leads down to proliferation and damage in a way that patients will develop fibrosis. So patients who have moderate to severe disease, even when they get better, may still be left with poor lung function and damage to their lung. Okay. I've kind of put together as to why this is, a, is, is such a severe disease and why is it a different than other. I kind of covered that before. The tests have been put together. Sensitivities were mentioned before. The antigenic test is a quick test, but again, it's positive. It, it may have false negatives. Uh, the sensitivity of the PCR test is not as good as we would like it to be. And 
the mm -hmm. antibodies. Antibodies more have a role in epidemiology. It just tells you that you were exposed to the virus. And generally the IgM antibodies becomes positive in the second week. The other antibodies become positive, IgG becomes positive in the third week. In the limited time, I would like to point out a few other things because I knew uh, Dr. Reddy was gonna point out some of the medicines that he had talked, uh, that have been used for this, for this condition. As of now, the drug that's approved in USA remains remdesivir. What is the evidence? Two different studies showed that patients who were on the ventilator, again, not people, people who are at home, those who are on the ventilator, when they got this medicines, they improved a little earlier as compared to those who didn't get it. So remdesivir is a good drug, but it is not the panacea. And secondly, it is only available as IV. Thirdly, it can have other major side effects as well. It is not to be given in renal failure. It can cause LFT abnormality. So this is a very specific condition. What else do we have? Dexamethasone, again, for very sick people who have lung damage, very specific area. Hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine have been mentioned before. We're not using in this country now, but it's obviously used in many other parts of the world. The jury is still out. If you look at the basic science, it's an immune modulator in the sense that it does affect the infective, <clears throat> infectivity of the virus by upregulating your immune function. How effective is that? is not clear. My own personal view in mild disease, if you take it, probably it is better. But what happens in first few days of the disease process, you have tiredness, fatigue, little bit of fever. Who goes to the doctor at that time? Nobody. And that's why the initial phase in which these immune modulators may be more helpful generally is missed because none of us and most people don't seek the help or the help is not available to, to the general public at that time. I would also point out patients who are very sick, we are putting them on blood thinners because uh, Dr. Eddy mentioned about uh, some of his uh, medications like Plavix, but the, the drug of choice in my mind remains uh, low nox or low molecular weight heparin, or if the need be, you can use newer no NOAX or anticoagulants as well. Because we know in third and fourth week in those patients who have high D dimers, one of the lab markers, if they are elevated, these patients are going to develop thrombosis in their blood, in their, in their blood vessels, whether it's in the stroke, portal hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary embolism, DVTs, mesenteric ischemia, et cetera, et cetera. Mention has already been done of Favirapir. Uh, a medication that was, which actually has very good activity against the common flu and was is being studied and approved for treatment for general flu in Japan, then in Germany and now in India as well. It is an oral medication. Again, it's an, <clears throat> in, in a way it acts against the RNA polymerase, very effective drug. But I would call, uh, say with a little bit of caution, we know many medicines which in vitro means in the lab, they look great, but they're not as great when it comes to the human host. I will mention so how we can, we can do other things. Please think about the mask. The masks think everybody should know. It should cover the nose, the bridge of the nose. Let me go back. Bridge of the nose till your throat, till below the chin. That no it's effective otherwise. <laughs> and why hand hygiene is important. Let me put the scientific evidence. Hopefully that will convince people to use it and physicians to use it. The virus is a double virus. It's a, wire, it's a particle inside and then a particle outside. The outside particles are hydrophobic, means these balls that I'm seeing on, on this virus on the right-hand side, they, they are very similar to what the soap particle is. So when you use water and soap, it washes the virus from anywhere. So folks, in my mind, three things, the social distancing, using a mask, but most effectively for healthcare workers, even if just washing hands with a simple soap, will prevent the spread of the disease because if you have to decrease R0 from 2.5 to less than one means each person cannot affect more than one person, or even less than that, then only this virus will go away. I will leave you with a thought and we'll develop this further. We need to think of life in, in a different way. Dr. Patel mentioned it. McKinsey and company have put together a nice model as to how leaders can change and act in these situations. It is a 5R model. Please allow me to say one second about it. There should be a resolve, meetings like this, education, and the leaders should have the resolve to meet the challenge. We have done that. There should be resilience on part of the public. 
the uh, people in general, they should be doing the three things so that we can track, treat, and uh, and trace the, the the people who are are prone to it and also who are the, the are harboring the virus and affecting it. Third is return. We need to return back to our work, to our back to our basics, to, to in, in some way start to restart your business, you start start your work. Telemedicine is done. Was is an example as to how physicians are are returning back to their effective work. Fourth thing is reimagination. The physician's office is being reimagined. The, the, the procedures are being done in a different way. And if time will allow me, I will elaborate this further. And lastly is reform. Gone are the days. And I believe namaste is much better than shaking hands. The whole world has finally have come, on, come around to accepting it. That would be one such simple reform. But there are many such ways of thinking it. So all of us should think of everything that we do in our life in this four R. Resolve, resilience, return, reimagination, and reform. And you will see, you will make a change in your own self, in your own society, in your own country. The, 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 the outcomes will be much better. Thank you much for your kind attention. I will stay back uh, and for any questions, comments, or jokes at this point of time. Thank you. Thank you. You have a great command of this subject, uh, Dr. Talwar. No. Uh, you have, you have passion and compassion for, uh, with, with patients and with, uh, with this disease. So we are fortunate to have you and then we want to stay on and to the second part of your talk. Sure. So we'll come to that. I appreciate your time. So we'll, we won't take further. Uh, so we'll go to the next speaker, Dr. Nageshwar Reddy. Yes. So I'll go ahead and introduce Dr. Nageshwar Reddy. Dr. Nageshwar Reddy, fondly called by friends as Nagi, is a dear friend, an accomplished researcher and the world's best GI endoscopist. I have personally seen his endoscopy skills and can attest to that, that he is the best endoscopist in the world, especially when it comes to ERCPs. He is the son of our Guru, uh, Guru Garu, Dr. Bhaskar Reddy, the former principal of Karnul Medical College. So we have a lot of respect for his father also. Dr. Reddy is the chairman of the Asian Institute of Gastroenterology, Hyderabad. He has received numerous awards, including Padma Bhushan. We are very lucky to have, have him as one of our speakers. And he'll be talking about COVID-19 situation in India from, and also from GI perspectives. So it's a combination talk. So Nagi, further, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Nagi Shuredi. Uh, thank you, Adi. I'd like to thank uh, Nata for the uh, kind invitation and for asking me to be a part of this very distinguished panel. Uh, what I'm going to do now is to give a brief on what's happening in COVID in India and a little on gastroenterology. I realize that a lot of audience is lay audience and not doctors. And therefore, I think we require to uh, go past actual science into something what's happening in India. It may be interesting. So I think you have to stop sharing your slides so that I can put my slides on. Okay, Narayan Reddy, go ahead and share. Yeah, I think you have to shift so that I can get my slides on. So I'm going to share my slides from here itself. So if you can... Uh, yeah, that setting, is, that setting is on. Yeah. Setting is on. Yeah. Uh, you should be able to yeah, share your screen. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're good, Andy. Okay, so I think uh, you'll be seeing my slides soon. Uh, as I said, it's going to be a little general talk of what's happening in India because some of you may be curious out there and also a little on gastroenterology because I'm a gastroenterologist. So briefly, what happened with COVID in India was that in early March, we started seeing some cases. In fact, the first cases were students returning from Wuhan to Kerala in January end. But in February, we started seeing some cases it was only in uh, somewhere around uh, March beginning that we started to realize the nature of this disease. And as you can see from the graph here, since then there's been an increase, slow increase in April, May, but an exponential increase subsequent to that. So we have now reached a total of almost 400,000 cases. Fortunately, the mortality is only 12,000 now, up to now. 
and this is uh, again showing you the more recent uh, data that's what's happening in the last few weeks the cases have been increasing by about 14000 a day by american standard they don't look uh, large but uh, what happened in india was that it used to be 1000 2000 now it's coming to 14000 every day but what's important is the fatality rates are only about 3.3% and this is i think a positive thing for our country uh, but what is very different in india is that if you actually look at india as a whole there's a huge geographical variation that is occurring in fact uh, some parts of india like in maharashtra gujarat delhi and tamil nadu are having very high incidences this is partly because of increased testing but partly because we still don't know why whether it's a different virus in fact what happened in india was uh, there's been a lot of genomic study of this virus at the national institute of virology in pune there's several uh, different genomic types there seems to be one the milder variety which came from china the more aggressive one which seems to have come from europe so you can see from the indian map here that although all of us all the indians are in the same storm facing the same storm we are in different boats the boats are different in different parts of the country the boats are different uh, whether you are rich or poor or whether you have access to healthcare or not so a lot of difference and that's why there is this huge demographic difference that we are seeing uh, so what happened was that although we detected the first case in january it was only end of march that the government actually realized the gravity of the problem and the first lockdown came uh, on 24th march and then subsequently based on modeling that was done in cambridge and other places indian government decided to increase this lockdown it went on up to early part of june there were four lockdowns and finally in early june there was unlocking uh, what happened in us earlier but unlocking happened here at that point of time our lives have changed since then in fact uh, uh, before corona this is what hospitals this was a typical outpatient in our hospital and you can see what happened after corona this it's absolutely getting empty so this is a dramatic change that occurred in at least the physicians lives also getting to the doctor is becoming more difficult and then this is uh, outside the lobby of a hospital you can see that there is a long queues waiting because the patients then go through a sanitation chamber which is becoming common in india and then go through checks uh, screening like in the airport they distance themselves sitting at uh, distances then you can see that they have their checks done and finally to reach the doctor would take them at least 2 hours normally it's long in india but it's getting much longer so the lives of the patients have also completely changed our um, dresses have changed and of course we are now aware that uh, as i think as both prem and uh, uh, dr talwar have pointed out that uh, we have to be careful as healthcare workers and this is what we are doing now that most of us is to do endoscopies casually we just are gowns on but now we have all this uh, shields and masks and so on and what is very important and this is what we learned from the experience of what happened both in china and italy talking to friends there we find that if you are protected properly the chance of a healthcare worker getting infected is extremely low our infection healthcare worker infection is to be high earlier but now it's come to almost zero because of the protections that we're having and this is very important now coming to the gi part i'm a gastroenterologist initially when this virus came with our oh, we are not involved it's only the pulmonologist but we realized that one third of the cases can have gastrointestinal symptoms like diarrhea nausea and so on this is because the virus the receptors for the virus are present in the whole gastrointestinal tract uh, the virus is present in the stool in 50% of the patients even after it's absent from the respiratory tract and this is very important for future epidemiology because it may be spread to the fecal oral route but 10 to 50% of the patients have liver injury especially if the underlying uh, alcoholic liver disease or non alcoholic fatty liver disease there is more chance of liver injury because the receptors for the virus are also present in the cholangiocytes in the liver but the most important thing about the gastroenterology is that this uh, one third to two thirds of the patients in some series actually have loss of smell and loss of taste and this can present very early i have seen patients who come and tell me i have lost smell and lost taste when we didn't know this earlier we just say okay try some medication but now we know this can be the earliest symptom of covid and we are very careful in observing these patients uh, of course coming back to non specifics the lockdown had several benefits in our country we had capacity building we had very few icus very few ventilators but this has increased now we now understand the disease so well that some of the therapies are being placed in a proper place 
and of course this mortality surge that could have occurred is probably absent but there of course the downsides and one of the most important downsides that happened in india especially was how this disease got stigmatized mainly because of politicians who came and talked about variety of things so it's got a huge stigma now so much so that unfortunately we know that majority of these patients recover only about 3% mortality small percentage require hospitalization but the word corona has now become so dangerous to our lay public that uh, people are not reporting if they have fevers and this is causing more problems in fact i have had many patients i see them and i say oh, i'm sorry you have a cancer stomach or cancer colon the first reaction of the patient is oh doctor thank you it's not corona no so that's that's so much of stigma that they feel is more dangerous than cancer and so on also when the lockdown was removed in this country people thought the virus has disappeared so what happened was that uh, we sort of uh, unfortunately exposed ourselves like this you can see the wine shops opened first large number of queues with patients who are not masked also who unfortunately started spreading the virus again and migrant labor started going back to their places again you can see many of them huge queues there infection spread so we got the second wave the lockdown created some comfort but once is opened up and especially in the last few weeks we are seeing a dramatic increase in many of our cities and part of this is because of these two reasons but there are also positives and this is Darawi slum in Mumbai the asia's largest slum where millions of people live when this virus first came there in march everybody was worried they thought the whole slums are going to get completely infected but the government there got into very severe action cordoned off the whole whole of the uh, slum and what they did was they put uh, contact tracing very effectively and now in fact the lowest incidence of the virus in, in bombay is in the slum area because of this effective uh, contact tracing isolation and uh, complete uh, sealing of this area i think this again shows that in india we can do this especially even in uh, areas where there's not enough education and so on but requires a lot of will power and a lot of uh, dedication by the politicians and officials the other thing that india started was this aarogya setu this was a phone app based on what happened in korea in china and japan they thought that probably this would uh, sort of help us to contact trace and isolate this is now being taken up by some patients and it's become compulsory when you're traveling in air and so on but unfortunately it's not picked up as as much as it should but hopefully this will help us in future a lot of innovations coming in this area one of the other positives about india is the low mortality in fact if you look at a case fatality rate is 3% but i believe the true mortality is much much lower that is true mortality in terms of millions of per population the lowest in the world there are several reasons for this maybe it's less than actually 1% uh, the age of the patient majority of our people are below 65 uh, rural population which is widespread so they are not getting it as much as in the uh, as in the urban areas comorbid conditions which uh, are much less compared to hypertension or so on in other countries we have probably an innate immunity because of repeated parasitic infestation there is a bcg theory which has not been proved now because of studies from israel but most important is several other factors and briefly uh, what we have done research in our institutes has showed that there are mutations in the proteins that help to get this virus inside so in our host body there are proteases which help the virus which talwar and prem had earlier alluded to what we have found is that when we did sequencing of these proteases we found that there are definitive mutations which actually decrease the activity of protease and this i think is very fortunate for indians because 50% of us seem to have this mutation uh, there are other problems that have come post lockdown in addition to the surge that we are seeing we are seeing a large number of asymptomatic cases this is again very peculiar to india and i believe this may be partly because of this uh, mutations that we have uh, icmr has estimated that 60 to 70% of cases in india are asymptomatic cases so the reopening of the hospitals has created problem especially because we have to protect our healthcare workers for example this is typically what happened yesterday in a hospital 400 cases came to the hospital to see gastroenterologists or cardiologists not with covid symptoms they came but as a screening process that we did in all of them and now we screen all the patients for procedures before they go for a therapeutic endoscopy and so on we found that 10% 40% of them were positive they didn't come for covid they came for other things uh, which means they actually asymptomatic carriers so when we looked at the antibodies in our 400 cases only one person had antibody positive which means we are in a stage with a large number of asymptomatic cases without immunity in the in the public and this i think is a little dangerous situation for us 
Uh, so we have to be careful on how we look after our healthcare workers. A lot of measures we put in, we don't have time. But what has changed for us is that now uh, in India, there's to be a lot of conferences. Every week we used to get together, have these meetings, have workshops and so on. This has dramatically changed. Nobody's moving. The whole education is now becoming tele-education. Every day we have hundreds of seminars. In fact, uh, we are getting a um, toxic dose of these webinars now in India. And hopefully, uh, they'll be moderated to proper extent. We are also changing in terms of telemedicine. Uh, telemedicine was illegal in India till COVID came. And now government has legalized this. I think telemedicine is not a proper way to look after a patient. You still have to see, feel, and see what's happening. But unfortunately, telemedicine uh, is the one the way we are going about. I think 60 to 70% of our medicine practice now is uh, telemedicine. Uh, coming finally to the treatment aspects, the solidarity trial which WHO has put, which is uh, US is not part, but the rest of the world is part, is being now going on very actively. Several randomized controlled trials. Now, compare going to hydroxychloroquine, I think again Dr. Talwa pointed out this that this is uh, not something that is being used in US. Uh, ICMR now recommends the Indian Council of Medical Research that we should use it as prophylaxis for healthcare workers, only for healthcare workers. This is based on a randomized control trial they did in the All India Institute where they found that healthcare workers who took uh, hydroxychloroquine once a week were protected. Still not yet published, but this is again a little controversial area. So not every healthcare worker is actually taking it because of the toxicity. Hospitalized patients are frequently getting hydroxychloroquine and doxy all over the country. We have been using steroids extensively from very beginning. Usually it was uh, methyl prednisolone in ICUs. Uh, patients on ventilators, but now of course we have switched to dexamethasone uh, because of recent reports from London. Remdesivir uh, is just come in. The three companies in India which have been approved to make this uh, intravenous, and again I think there's too much hype about this drug. I'm not sure how useful it is. But what is interesting is just yesterday the Director uh, General of India, the the drugs controller of India, has approved feviparvir. Pepperweed was used uh, in Japan initially for normal flu. Uh, there's a company, Glenmark, which is now actually made it. Uh, in fact, it was not uh, done from the original molecule, but they developed their own uh, pathways. Uh, this is now approved now, and it's believed to be useful for mild, moderate cases. There are no good randomized control trials. Most of the use has been in Russia, China, and Japan. Uh, I think we are now going to start doing randomized control trial with this. Unfortunately, I think this is going to be overused drug because for mild and moderate, we know many of these patients recover. But because of the fear, this drug, which costs about 100 rupees per tablet, has to be taken 3,600 milligrams twice a day first, followed by 800 milligrams twice a day for next two weeks, are going to be used and it's going to be overused in this country. Convalescent plasma. Uh, it's been approved by ICMR. There have been small trials. There's a now randomized control trial going on. We have also started using it. And uh, we believe this may be good in addition to monoclonal antibodies when they come. So this is uh, the summary of what is happening about treatment in our country. There's also a huge uh, lay interest in immunity boosters because this is what everybody is saying. In fact, we have this yoga specialist coming in with different immunity boosters. People are starting to uh, look at this. The vitamin C daily at 500 milligrams, zinc at 60 milligrams, vitamin D at 60,000 units weekly is what is being advocated. And this is especially important for Indian patients because vitamin D and zinc levels are very low normally. So it believed that boosting this, and this has been shown, of course, in studies that boosting this may be helpful. There are others like curcumin and uh, ginger and all tablets coming in. And this is one example of how they're becoming uh, very common because they don't have side effects and Indians don't mind using this. So this is, again, something which is different from the rest of the world. I think finally coming to what this virus has started lessons in our country that no man is an island. Uh, I think we all globalize so much that whatever happens in some part of the country rapidly spreads to the other part of the country. It also taught us that nature is supreme, that we have to respect nature and that we have to follow certain precautions. We don't have definitive treatment, universal masking, physical distancing and hand hygiene are the main methods of how we're going to control this. Hopefully, I think uh, Dr. Varaprasad is going to talk about vaccines and the new normal is going to change only after the vaccines come. Once again, I'd like to thank Nata for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nagi. Thank you for uh, this is very high level and uh, you have a lot of great command as usual. You give a great 
great talks we heard many many times so thank you very much so the next uh, speaker i think we'll come back to if you can say we can come back to the questions as soon as all the speakers are done so the next speaker is uh, dr varaprasad reddy garu he is the founder of uh, shanta biotechnics named after his mother his beloved mother this was the first biotechnology based vaccine company through totally indigenous technology in india they produce low cost and highly effective vaccinations in india they have donated about 180 million rupees to the poor people of india he had received many awards including highly coveted padma bhushan dr reddy is the man with first hand knowledge and experience with vaccinations and he will talk about covid 19 vaccinations when and until then what that is dr reddy's talk so varaprasad reddy gari without further ado please take over namaskar vandi uh i have heard all the speakers who spoke before me starting with dr prem reddy garu and uh, i have to compliment them that they have covered extensively on several issues uh, one of the issue what i wanted to because i am not a scientist i am not a doctor i am an engineer by providence i came into healthcare and that too into vaccines and i had uh, the opportunity to bring recombinant based uh, vaccines into the country for the first time with totally indigenous technology we didn't depend on any western source for this technology so that is uh, a point of pride for our scientists uh, i am not the scientist i only made a team of good scientists and they developed it i was a facilitator i wanted to address in a different way uh, because all of you are doctors who dealt with the patients and most of you know what is happening around the globe i want to limit myself on certain aspects which partly i think dr talwar with his social conscious he has covered it dr nayas redigaru uh, wonderfully he has dealt with all the available treatments and then what is happening in india he has given the indian perspective i am also going to limit myself to indian perspective that too little away from science what are the things that we should do after this covid before that i have to say that few aspects i mean about vaccines what kind of vaccines are there how they are effective what are the various uh, vaccine initiatives were taken around the globe i will briefly talk on that it has taken a toll on lives of many and more than lives livelihoods that is very important if you see the uh, interesting statistical data in the last 3 months because of covid we lost around 400000 people but in the same last 3 months because of flu around 3.5 million i'm sorry 3.5 350000 people i am trying to translate into thousands 350000 people lost their life suicidal deaths are 390000 malaria 400000 road accidents around 400000 hiv 240000 alcoholic deaths are 560000 smoking and tb related 816000 with cancer 1.2 million so when we compare with other deaths covid is not that much but it has attracted the if everybody around the globe because it occurred not in one place in one state or in one country throughout the world at one go it has come when people were shaken up and many people call it mahamari rakshasi it is a devil that and this in a philosophical way i feel that it is god sent it is the 11th avatar of vishnu to correct our lifestyles our attitudes to life our way of running the businesses our way of living is not correct it wanted to come and give a correction mode uh, we have done lot of damage to environment and we have been very cruel uh, in 84 lakh species of life man thought that he is the only supreme 
and he wanted to eat away everything what is moving they ate snakes they ate uh, m- m- crabs everything whatever is moving they started eating it ahimsa it is too much mother earth could not tolerate this i think it has sent a correction mechanism which is very invisible see what happened to our science what happened to our so so called say i mean recovery researches and other things we are talking about sending a man to moon but we are not able to solve our own problem in this in this planet and we are having major programs to go to send to man to moon, uh, mars for uh, holidays but we are not able to solve the present problem like it is a pandemic and which created pandemonium in my opinion this is a pandemonium governments watch helplessly and medical professionals are trying tirelessly common man is not getting the bharosa what we call the faith in the system many labor they walked away from the country i mean from one state to other states and we have been just watching them what is happening see every other day we get a announcement that hydroxychloroquine is going to help and other day they say that trial so fail so stop it icmr who all these institutes were pre- prestigious institutes they fumbled they have gone uh, they have gone forward and back backward there is no consistent uh, information to the common man which is very disturbing so what i want to say is uh, definitely it, uh, in economic terms i have as an entrepreneur i can say the global economic cost of this virus is whooping 6 to 7 trillion dollars in india alone if you see we are losing in our country every day around 4.5 billion dollars or 32000 crores every day that is the economic impact i told you it cost lives no doubt but it has cost lot of livelihoods many people lost their jobs here and they have become very uncertain we have around 4.5 million labor force they are the important pillars of the indian economy the construction workers etc and they are all on the streets without food they have been left to lurch and government could not take any action in right time so this is the impact of this covid and naturally around the globe more than 1000 companies started attempting to make a vaccine and uh, at least i can say uh, india also is trying to develop a vaccine with uh, foreign collaborations you know any new vaccine to develop in a western society it cost them 600 to 800 million dollars to start from ab initio okay in india the costs are lower even if you attempt as a new vaccine it will cost not less than 100 million if not 600 but where is the money to put that kind of money no a pharmaceutical company can afford to put so much of money to r&d in 100, 100 million dollars no company has ever invested in india i can honestly say that but we have definitely taken up vaccines when other countries they have done it we have taken a different route so vaccine is established with its own process but we have followed a different process and we have replicated the vaccine at lower cost that's a generic way that's what we have been doing now all indian companies have some collaborative arrangements with other country uh, vaccine companies around the globe and a uh, lot of initiatives are there i will list out but before that uh, what other speakers didn't speak about vaccines there are four six varieties of five varieties of vaccines that are being attempted now first is live attenuated vaccine live attenuated vaccines the pros of it is this it is very strong and lasting immunity but there is a risk of reversion to virulence so that is also being tried for example polio vaccine oral polio is a live attenuated vaccine there was a cure to some extent but unfortunately some people got affected by it also so it is not well accepted but people are trying to do that and killed vaccine is there no risk of virulence less immunogenic than live vaccine other is very it recently very popularized vaccine is recombinant protein vaccine what shanta attempted to do it uh, around 92 and the first recombinant vaccine came in the form of hepatitis b vaccine these are totally indigenous and this can be targeted to the key protein of the virus now they call it s1 protein it can be easily targeted to that and is very appropriate kind of vaccine it is being attempted by many companies 
but it has one weakness with adjuvant only it, it can be highly immunogenic without adjuvant uh, we have to give more dosage so we can't cover more people if adjuvant is added to it then definitely it will be more effective then there is a dna vaccine it's very easy and inexpensive very faster to develop and potential for lasting immunity and no need of cold chain so dna vaccine has wonderful positives but the problem is potential for genomic integration it can integrate with the human genome and allergic to dna and there is a best vaccine is mrna vaccine that is also being tried out now it is very easy inexpensive faster to make potential for lasting immunity and no need of cold chain and also no risk of genomic integration but the problem is so far it is unproven technology there is no mrna vaccine in the market if it is going to be done for covid it will be the first one to come into the market so this is the five varieties of vaccines and many companies are trying all the five but at least from my side i have to say shanta is now part of sanofi sanofi has taken major stock into shanta as a promoter and uh, founder of that company shanta i remain as a shareholder but uh, sanofi is major shareholder the r and d what they are doing you have to understand very interesting uh, aspect here in this uh, un I mean, unprecedented times of emergency two rival companies major giants in vaccines gsk and uh, sanofi they are contenders in the market for market share they never saw eye to eye on many issues and when it is coming to business but in this kind of emergency situation they have come together they have joined hands together of course i should not say hands no we cannot join hands in this covid times and they came to an agreement that they want to develop a vaccine jointly and they have been funded by american government they have given to sanofi 675 million dollars to come out with a vaccine a free component based vaccine they have joined with gsk for the purpose of getting adjuvant appropriate adjuvant from gsk gsk is very strong in adjuvants and uh, sanofi is very strong in recombinant technology they are coming together to get an effective vaccine they are in phase 2 trials now probably in all probability by next year 2021 middle of 21 they will transfer the technology to indian uh, fit for uh, shanta biotech and shanta is preparing themselves to produce this vaccine cost effectively in high volumes at low cost that is the philosophy of shanta make it available in local currency make it affordable so in all probability shanta will start producing next year september august not before that and many people in india making statements very loosely vaccine is coming next month vaccine coming in 15 days 20 days which is very wrong based on this our political leaders are taking a call on lockdowns and very bad the wrong information misinformation uh, this disinformation is very dangerous to society and based on that political leaders are taking a call whether to keep, keep the lockdown or lift the lockdown or li lifting the lockdown with some conditions etc the real fact is the vaccine is not that easy to come it takes minimum 18 months to 2 years even if regulatory agency coming forward to have some concessions in the testing process see compared to a drug vaccines take long time because of its testing process it has to be tested at several stages of development they have uh, ibsc committee institutional biosafety committee then they have rcgm review committee on genetic manipulation they have genetic engineering and application committee and after that G, uh, drug control general of india dcgi and also at every stage they have to get a clearance it is not that easy you know bureaucratic delays science delays are some part bureaucratic delays are other part they have to have discuss this in the committees and committees that they are not formed that easily even if the committee is formed the quorum is not complete with a lot of absence and after the committee is met and then taken a decision the minutes are not well prepared in time and they are not circulated is not approved so you know the process is very long 18 months minimum and two years is normal but other vaccines what we developed per year were four years to five years in this emergency situation dcgi is coming forward even usfda has given fast track clearances for example remdesivir they have agreed to use it but again they have backtracked 
Now, remdesivir, please stop it. They have given indication. So it's the case with hydroxychloroquine. Uh, what I'm trying to say is in this pandemic situation, a lot of pandemonium has occurred, both from institutions, from political leaders. Doctors are tirelessly working, but they are also confused what kind of treatment should go on and what should not be. Now, there is some clarity. Now, India, recently, yesterday, day before yesterday, Friday, they have given the clearance for a medicine, a tablet, uh, they call it Fabi flu. Uh, probably that will give some uh, what you call confidence in the people. But as Dr. Nayas Rudiger said, rightly said, it may be overused or abused. If be there will be some control. People, they have the head mentality. If they hear something, they go all along on that. That is very dangerous. And now I have to say, the different vaccines are in which stage. They, I told you five varieties of vaccines. In my the other important information, what we should do is uh, Oxford University. They have conducted animal trials at one go. They the trials were not successful. They stopped it. But again, I don't know how far it is true. They their counterpart in India. I mean, they have transferred this technology. They are trying to transfer the technology to Serum Institute. They say that they are ready with two million doses of vaccine, even without trials completed, how they can produce a vaccine and how they are waiting for the clearance. I have no idea. But these are, these are called misinformations, are nonsensical informations, but people are being fed with this kind of information by media. Media is very active. They have nothing but showing only COVID data, only this kind of information. They announced that Oxford University vaccine is ready to be transferred to a serum Institute, they are coming out. They say that they have already produced 2 million and waiting for the clearance. But 2 million is not enough. They have to produce thousands of millions of doses. Next, US firm Moderna completed phase 2 trials. Phase 3 trials it will enroll 30,000 participants and trials will begin next month, they said. That means it's not yet ready. But Trump announced on 6th June, 2 million vaccines, vaccines are already produced and efficacy is also proved. Then they will be administered. We do not know whether we had Moderna in mind and one wonders why anyone would produce 2 million doses even before its safety is established. There is a news that vaccines are in pipeline in Australia, Israel, and also in other countries. Russia too claimed that they have vaccine. They are producing it by 2021. US company vaccine is working on University of Georgia. Then they are saying that they are in the first phase of human trials and they will come in soon for phase two. Then, uh, okay. uh, India, we have six companies, vaccine companies, and all of us have some connection with the outside uh, development agency. Shanta, I told you, with Sanofi, and uh, Bharat Biotech with uh, Wisconsin University, uh, Serum Institute with Oxford University. On 25th May, I mean, sorry, 25th, yes, 25th May, Dr. Harshwadhan, our Central Health Minister, he said that 14 vaccines are in uh, development. I don't know. There are only six companies, but how 14 numbers have come. These are the misinformations. I, what I am trying to say is, in this kind of pandemic situations, people should speak truth when they know the truth. When they do not know, I think they should not give this kind of wrong information. Indian government donated $15 million to Gavi Institute. It is the Gavi, you know, International Institute. Their purpose and mission is to develop vaccines. On June 5th, they have donated. It indicates, it indicates that the government is not very optimistic about indigenous efforts. Otherwise, they would have given that money to Indian companies. You should know the Indian situation. I am giving the Indian perspective. The defense budget, the defense budget in this country is 4,71,000 crores. And for health, it is 69,000 crores. Where is 4,71,000? Where is 69,000? They don't respect health in this country. And also for education, 99,000 crores. I think they should change their priority. They should revisit their budget allocations. Health is more important. LOC, enough control is important, I agree. If they lose one foot of land, they are so much worried, they are investing billions of dollars in defense budget. Is it not important a man's life? That is the thing what we learned in our childhood. But now, for one foot of land, they want to spend billions of dollars. 
for health they don't spend people they are, are we not losing people so they should revisit government should understand the future wars are not going to be by uh, military aircraft or submarines it's going to be life these kind of weapons life i mean what you call jeeva sankethika ayudhal these are the kind of invasion i mean the invasions will occur probably even this back uh, virus also is man made that's what some people even trump is talking like that i believe in that it is all man made not uh, anything which is coming from nature nature is not that cruel but we also are being doing very cruel to nature and nature might have come in this way to give us a lesson to reform ourselves to correct ourselves and uh, i want to speak six or seven points for the future Yeah, okay yeah please do it with five minutes maybe you can go five minutes yes i will close in four or five minutes yeah okay lessons for the future let all the countries in the world understand that public health is government's responsibility it cannot be in private and they need to strengthen government hospitals let governments give priority to medical education practice and research let government spend money on education at public cost so that people would realize the importance of hygiene and sanitation create jobs in rural areas don't everything come to only up cities and metropolitans create jobs in rural areas discourage urbanization see that urban slums are not formed lest they become hotbeds of epidemic let there be epidemic centers for each district headquarters discourage mass gatherings decentralized <coughs> development for better management let there be doorstep volunteer system to monitor public health and help the need at the hour of crisis let us change our lifestyles eat fresh healthy food maintain personal hygiene improve our immunity avoid restaurants my advice to dr kiran but i already is in the restaurant let kiran patel restaurants are not to be encouraged anymore let us develop more and more vaccines to boost our immunity against viruses let the experts not mislead public with half knowledge let them be sure of themselves before declaring something last but not least let us elect those leaders who have some understanding about scientific issues let us let us not be swayed away by theatrical performances by demagogues you. i hope you understand how our political leaders are talking about covid there are demagogues thank you very much thank you thank you for your talk and it is passionate and and uh, from his heart very from his heart and sincere talk it will be a short of time that's why we have to move on so i understand that dr suresh reddy has to leave so can, can you say two two minutes suresh can you can you talk he's president of api he has conflicting uh, events going on with api so i think maybe he has left already i suppose but okay uh, th- thank you very much varu uh, prasad reddy garu thank you for your talk it is great talk and sincere talk okay the next you know we we were going to talk about this vaccination from us perspective so dr arunab Tal- talwar no no we got we uh, i think it should continue he covered it well and i think to be fair for other speakers i'm going to skip my talk and let others do it because we're getting late and i can come back for uh, during question time if there is anything he covered it very well so let's just continue with other other speakers to be fair to them appreciate appreciate it uh, talwar nab uh, thank you very much uh, appreciate it but maybe you can say few words at the end then after uh, kavita and uh, and also dr jiredi prasad is done suresh reddy is there i thought suresh didn't respond when i asked him he, he had to leave i think suresh are you there? Yeah, I'm back. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm running three zooms Actually, at the same time. Actually, according to schedule, according to schedule, Kavita is supposed to go. But uh, but can you talk for about two minutes? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm running three zooms at the same time, so I'm jumping into three different ahead. rooms. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah. Like uh, Afi, thank you. All my mentors are here. My role models are here. Uh, Doctor uh, Prem Chandra Reddy, Prem Reddy Garu, Var Prasad Reddy Garu, Naish Reddy Garu, Mohan Mallam. all uh, prasad ji reddy garu thank you so much uh, uh, for joining and friends uh, um, so um, i'll keep it very short uh, api uh, this uh, has been a, this year we started with our main goals were uh, 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 two main uh, public education events those are uh, 
uh, obesity prevention and the CPR training. And we have completed uh, CPR training in seven continents, including Antarctica and South America. And the same thing, obesity awareness. Obesity awareness, as you know, has been diagnosed as a disease now. And uh, when the COVID came, suddenly all our priorities changed. Uh, overnight, as you know, the doctors have to become soldiers uh, with uh, not proper training. We are never trained to see hundreds and hundreds of deaths uh, in a single day. And uh, psychologically, they are affected. And uh, even uh, pe uh, protective equipment was not adequate. The uh, machinery was not adequate. And uh, our soldiers uh, had to go into the war without proper equipment. But they did it. And uh, now we are able to control it. And uh, we have done several, several programs. Uh, uh, we have done uh, mass public education. Uh, we have released uh, press releases. And we are the first ones. Uh, the, uh, RP as the first organization in the country has called for a total lockdown in the country, uh, universal mask wearing and uh, first plasma treatment and steroids. Uh, and these are all the public education policies we did. And then coming to medical education, we organized more than 50 webinars. Uh, that's the education for the physicians and non-physicians. And we also raised the importance of uh, physical hygiene and uh, hand washing. And over that, we also did... Uh, several mentoring for medical students and residents. And uh, coming to research, we, all, we started some research projects like how it looks like Indians have more resistance to this than the uh, Americans here. And also we are uh, doing research projects on the plasma treatment. We are doing research projects on uh, uh, yoga along with our RP members uh, with uh, the Isha Foundation. Uh, several research projects going on. We also did uh, several charity, we raised uh, money significant amount of money to provide protective equipment in a lot of county hospitals where there are severe shortage. And recently with the Nurses Week, we honored 10,000 nurses uh, with uh, providing uh, lunches in over 37 states in the country, including Alaska and uh, Hawaii. And, uh, and we provided more than 1,000 online prescriptions uh, for visitors coming from India because they were stranded here, especially the parents and students who did not have insurance. Our physicians went beyond the call of duty and uh, provided work with the Indian Embassy and we provided more than 1,000 online prescriptions uh, crossing the states, um, state uh, lines. And uh, we did uh, several of these events and hopefully, and uh, as you know, several of our own physicians became positive, some of them critically ill and a few of them even died from this deadly disease. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and. Uh, uh, for giving me this opportunity and uh, we are very proud uh, uh, as you know like every seventh physician in the United States is an Indian physician and we are at the forefront and uh, I'm very proud of them and thank you all my mentors and role models here uh, and friends uh, for supporting this organization. Thank you. Thank you Suresh. <laughs> thank you very much. So if you if you have to excuse yourself that's fine but if you want to stay for questions it's it's your call. I will join you later. I had to go run another Zoom session. Zoom Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you very much. Okay, so moving on. Uh, so Dr. Kavita Reddy is the next speaker. Dr. Kavita Reddy is the rising star who is an emergency room physician and uh, integrative medicine specialist. Dr. Reddy is the incoming director of employee whole health of the Veterans Administration of the whole United States. The key word here is the whole health. And Dr. Kavita Reddy is going to talk about uh, future of healthcare delivery and how you can improve your own health. This is a very timely topic and also it's very useful for all of us and our families. So we, we welcome Kavita to go ahead and talk about it, enlighten us with, uh, with what we should be doing. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, if that's okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, so you know, we decided to really end with this piece of information to all of you because there, this really is a time for us to stop and look at what our healthcare system is within the United States and how we care for our people and individuals. It's an opportunity for us to assess how we're not only responding to patients, but how we're responding for ourselves, for our own self-care. And so COVID-19 reminds us really of the need to look at our physical and mental health. Um, I think it's been beautifully stated by a lot of the speakers already. You know, COVID-19 is one piece of the equation, a very important piece of the equation, 
but look at all of the resulting effects this is having on everybody from social isolation to a change in how we deliver care, not just healthcare, all businesses, some shutting down, some doing things virtually, many of us having to care for our own children at home and become teachers in addition to our jobs and other focuses, the stress levels are actually heightening quite a bit. And you couple that with this idea of, we don't exactly know when the treatments will come. We don't exactly know when a vaccine will come. It leaves us in a state of not feeling in control. Um, and when you lose that sense of control over what's happening in your life in the moment, that's when you start to get feelings of anxiety and stress and it can significantly affect mental health. And so I think it's really important for us to stop and understand how do we not only deal with this public health crisis, but in the midst of this, as Dr. Vara Prasad is saying, there are other crises going on. We're looking at a system of social inequality, healthcare disparities, environmental issues. You know, as we start to have a growing population in the world, our proximity next to environmental um, areas that we never used to be around might expose us to pathogens that we usually, um, our systems are not used to. So again, how do we look at the climate, the world, the people, the social inequalities? All of that is wrapped up into COVID-19. The awareness of all of this is, is a part of that. And so within the VA system, we are really on the forefront of transitioning healthcare to a whole health system of care. Um, as you guys hear some of my thoughts, you'll maybe recognize some of these whole health models that have been out there for a while, maybe even see elements of Ayurveda in this. But the idea is that we can't just be treating the symptoms and diseases. We have to be looking at the entire person, the whole person, mind, body, and spirit. If you actually look at the CDC and the AMA, they've been emphasizing methods to reduce stress and anxiety related to this pandemic. They are seeing an opportunity to address not only the burnout of healthcare providers, but the burnout of all individuals in general. And I highly recommend you checking out their websites to see some of the recommendations they have. And then I really wanna drive home this point that hasn't been mentioned yet. We talk a lot about COVID's impact on certain demographics, populations, and races, with the preponderance of people with diabetes and obesity really succumbing to um, COVID-19 and having the brunt of the mortality rate. But that isn't just COVID-19. This really should open our eyes to the fact that our healthcare system, our healthcare system has things that can be fixed. It has issues with how it delivers care and to whom it delivers care. So the issue is these are people that historically haven't had the greatest access to health literacy, to health care, to resources, interventions. And so I really should open our eyes to saying, how can we improve the very system that delivers care so that chronic disease and illness is actually what we're looking at and treating. And that then would help other diseases that come down the road. So we can go to the next slide. So what I wanna share with you is what we are doing in the VA system. For all of you out there, whether you're a healthcare provider or not, this is something I want you to take home and think about. In our lives, these are the things that matter to us. These are the elements that help us live our healthy and well-being lifestyle. And when one of these is out of balance, we lose that balance for our own wellness. You might recognize that many of these are the social determinants of health, how we have relationships, our surroundings, our sleep, our access to food or lack of access to food, and our resilience or our power of the mind. And what I really want to stress is that we have the power to actually improve our immune system. It is an innate healing process within us. And while we wait for the right medications, while we wait for the right vaccines, we should not really lose the opportunity to think about how we can help ourselves in this very moment. And so when we think about psychological stress, which many of our, us are feeling right now, uh, many of the healthcare workers have expressed that this is a daunting, scary time for them. And as an emergency medicine physician, I can tell you when I work my shifts, it's time zero. And then I count the days to know whether I'm actually gonna get sick or not sick. Um, so that stress is actually disrupting the immune system and is associated with pro-inflammatory cytokines. And we know COVID is connected to an inflammatory process when gone awry can actually create much of the mortality as you've heard. And then sleep, shorter sleep is actually connected to an increased risk of infection. 
Actually, studies have shown that under five hours of sleep can be connected to a 350% increase in rhinovirus. Um, and sleep deprivation may decrease the amount of melatonin that's secreted. And melatonin is very key to immune system and sleep, actually lowers as we age. And there's some thinking that maybe that's what the correlation is between certain demographics and populations of elderly folks getting more sick. And then nutrition. And this is something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, not something we were trained very well in in medical school, but something I have learned an immense amount in my integrative medicine training. Food can be therapy. And as we think about inflammation, what we eat on a day-to-day -day basis has an impact. So of course your vegetables and fruits that are high in flavonoids are gonna be anti-inflammatory. When you think about things like zinc or ionophores that help increase the absorption of zinc, like onions, apples that have quercetin or ECGC and green tea, there are actual foods that help us create a low inflammatory response in the body. And these are things we can do right now. Each one of these areas is an area that we can optimize. And as we think about the future of healthcare delivery, this is really how we help people mitigate disease and pain and chronic mental health illness by walking this circle and understanding how to really balance each section. So we can go to the next slide and I'll share a little bit about what VA is doing. Um, you know, telemedicine has been here and present in the United States for quite some time, but not in the degree it is now. In the last three months, we have had an astronomical increase in virtual care. It really is the future of healthcare delivery because if the future is based on health and well being, that can absolutely be delivered in a virtual world. If you think about social isolation, we know that's connected to depression, lower lifespan, and a lot of other disease processes. And telemedicine virtual care allows us to access people in their home, allows us to improve their health literacy, can impact some of those social determinants and healthcare disparities that we see. You heard people mentioning complementary and integrative health. It's actually mandated within our VA system to offer many of these approaches given the level of evidence. Yoga, meditation can be immensely helpful with depression, anxiety, stress, and pain. And so we offer all of these. You see pictures of how we offer this virtually and we have websites that allow people to tap into this knowledge from their own home. There's no reason you can't continue this type of care even when we can't come into the hospitals. Next slide. What we have done here and is accessible to all of you and really, again, my final thoughts for you is that we have to emphasize self-care and as clinicians, this is really important, but this is important for everybody. We have to take this moment to understand that what we are feeling from COVID-19, the mental health, the physical health, the fear, all of that we need to address through self-care resources. This site is actually accessible to all of you. Um, it's put together through multiple different stakeholders within VA. And as you can see, really tries to address resiliency, spiritual health, mind health, physical health, and they're easy to listen to podcasts or videos that you can do in your car, in your day, but injecting those into your day-to-day -day function will help you with some of the stress that's coming forward from this disease process. Um, and so I really highly encourage you to, to look at that, but I just wanna leave with saying this, I have a huge degree of optimism that COVID-19 is highlighting a lot of different political, environmental, healthcare and economic systems that we can improve so that we can face these kinds of challenges with much more vigor in the future. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back to you. Um, Dr. Adireddy, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kavita. It is a superb but futuristic talk. I think we should all be following her advice and try to prevent the COVID and other infections or, or reduce the mortality. Thank you very much. So next is, we have questions and answers. So uh, hopefully we can extend by another half an hour. Um, that, that's not a problem, Andy. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. thank you. So next is uh, we have Dr. G. Reddy Prasad. Uh, so that we're done with, uh, yeah, Dr. G. Reddy Prasad. So we want him to give about five minute uh, response. So basically Dr. G. Reddy Prasad is a very respected endocrinologist and a serial entrepreneur. His current uh, passion and research and uh, entrepreneurial activity is about artificial intelligence. And he's the head of a 200 physician member group of Pomona, California. We have a specific question for him. 
the food that goes inside the mouth is as important as the mask that goes over the mouth. So the mortality of COVID-19 is higher in patients with obesity and diabetes. So what should people do to curb these ailments? Dr. Giridi, go ahead. Well, very tough question, but anyway, uh, we had such a Andhra Mahanubhav elite speakers were there, and Varad uh, Prasad, you guys already told you about the diet. So you're already obese. You, you unfortunately you can't reverse it quickly. And uh, this quick snapshot of diabetes: we have about 34.2 million people in the United States have type two diabetes. Almost one in five don't even know that they have diabetes. And you have almost 88 million people are there, what we call as impaired fasting glucose, or simplistic term, pre-diabetes. So this is uh, additional risk factor. And uh, Dr. Kavita also mentioned about the food and uh, well, right habits and good habits. All this will play into effect with the prevention um, of uh, uh, our uh, maybe postponement of development of diabetes with uh, obese people with the reduce the weight and be active. Simplistic uh, solutions for this at least is you basically lose weight, eat right, be active. There are three different things which we need to do. But the, the topic of uh, uh, COVID-19, just like Varad uh, Prasad uh, said, 11th uh, thought came and uh, trying to change all your habits and uh, things like that, something is uh, coming out. So my uh, input for this is, especially some of these uh, hospitalized diabetic patients, you're using uh, high doses of steroids and it does pose a problem and uh, hospitalized, even on an outpatient basis, you important part is glycemic control for people who are non-physicians, like sugar control, keep them in the normal range that decreases the risk of uh, developing infections. As usual, diabetics do have increased incidence of, uh, I mean, decreased immunity, increased incidence of uh, infections, and they have associated uh, comorbid conditions like uh, hypertension and uh, vascular disease. And there's one, if at all, I have to see a, a little light uh, or uh, silver lining. You know, people, diabetics use ACE inhibitors, uh, which uh, blocks some of those. Prim uh, showed in his uh, uh, slides, this COVID virus attaches to itself a receptor. Uh, that receptor is actually uh, uh, occupied by uh, ACE inhibitors, which we commonly use in diabetics. Hopefully, that will reduce the complications. We don't know that that yet. So, my uh, quick and simplistic thing is somebody in an oral agents like metformin or something called SGL2 inhibitors like uh, uh, Jardians or Invokana. Got to be a little careful with this because uh, the intake of fluids and people may become problematic. And uh, so insulin really raises a very strong uh, necessity, long and short acting insulin, especially hospitalized patients. Other than that, really, I would uh, keep myself open for any questions because this is a vast subject. So, uh, I mean, I, everybody covered all aspects of uh, uh, at least whatever we know at this time. So I'll keep myself available for any questions mm -hmm. regarding uh, interventions and what need to be done. And a lot of uh, things came in diabetes for the last 40 years. Anyway, yeah. so I'll stop there. So uh, you have plenty of time for questions and I'll be available for any any questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jiri Degaro. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I think we got one question from the online. So so we have some prepared questions. So we'll, we'll go ahead and maybe you can make the brief answer, you know, uh, like a brief response. That way, multiple multiple faculty or multiple panel can respond. So one question I have is, uh, you know, there are three, four, five companies or major companies are trying for vaccination. So let's say this vaccination is available in phase three or phase two trial. So um, Dr. Talwar or um, Dr. Varaprasad Reddy or Prem or anyone, which, if they, all five companies are available at the same time, which one would you go with? Uh, Dr. Talwar, you can answer. Phase two or Dr. Varaprasad Reddy. Phase two or phase three. Which one would you pick? There are, you have five choices. So which Moderna or GSK or uh, AstraZeneca, which one would you go with? 
that looks like a question more for a stock market than, than this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but but lives are at stake, so we have people are willing to get the vaccination. So yes, let me let me see if I can uh, answer this question in a scientific way for you. Though Dr. Reddy did an incredible job, he is not even a physician, but I really enjoyed his talk because he gave a very nice view of the whole thing. Yeah. But let me see if I can get this. I don't know if this slide goes up. Can, is this slide being presented? No. The, the way it looks like as of now, uh, and uh, he has shown, Dr. Reddy pointed that out. This is an RNA virus. We have, we, and its infectivity and the way its strain is behaving is not, no, we have not dealt with this kind of this before. So of the eight, five, he said, there were actually eight ways of making a virus of making the, making the vaccination, I believe the RNA virus would be the one and that would probably hit the market. But I also want to point out more from clinical point of view, we would need more than one virus, more, more than one vaccine yes. for this condition. One vaccine will not fit, fit size, uh, will, will fit everybody's requirements. We would need more than one effective vaccination to control this condition. I do want to point out a little bit about mutation and strain. Uh, and a common people generally confuse the two as if they are interchangeable. No, viruses mutate all the time. And this virus, a part of the RNA is mutating all the time. Is it changing as a strain big, big enough? That is not clear, but still because of it, and this was pointed out before as well uh, from Dr. Nadi from Hyderabad as well, because of this, maybe we would need two or three types of viruses. As of now, as of now, to me, the Moderna effect, because it's new, it's novel, and they have ramped up their platform so much that they, are, they seem to be ahead of the curve, at least in United States point of view. But I also like the GSK and Sanofi pharmaceuticals approach. Why? I, I would, if I had to put my thought and, uh, and effort behind it, it, it they make more sense to me because uh, he, and Dr. Reddy pointed it out, GSK has the adjuvant technology. They by far are the best in that. And Sanofi has the rest of the technology. If they put together, I think they have a, a great chance of, of coming a, a ahead of this. The Oxford and the Pune Institute one, uh, the details are not available at this point of time. So I would not like to say anything much on it because what is not available scientific to, for scientific community to preview, it's hard to conjecturize. And as we know from this condition, we really can't just take things for granted and hypothesize this will be or that will be. So to me, it's the adjuvant technology with, with the recombinant technology of Sanofi that makes sense from the traditional pathway and the new pathway of Moderna does appear effective at this point of time. Uh, we would know the results at least in two, three months from them, maybe by August and to see where they are at this point of time. I hope I answered your question in this. Yeah, that's great, great answer, great answer. So, Varaprasad Redigaru, Japani, go ahead. Oh, you are on mute, mute, Varaprasad Redigaru, unmute. Dr. Talwar Saab, he has explained very well how the combination is going to be more effective and also Moderna vaccine. But there are other factors which will determine the choice of vaccine. First is we do not have clinical data. No company puts it across to public domain. We don't know what is their immunogenicity. What is their efficacy? Okay, safety is established. That's why they could move from animal trials to human trials. That is established. But how about efficacy? Did they ever publish any data? Nothing. Second thing is, how long the immunogenicity lasts? That is also important. That can be known only after several tests and they have to keep it on shelf. How long? This also determines whether this vaccine is acceptable or not. Suppose the immunogenicity lasts only for one month or two months or one year, then is it worth taking? The immunogenicity should last at least for three to four years or five years. And nobody has ever come across with the data. How to, how to choose a vaccine? If I take this vaccine, if it gives me protection for at least one year, then I intend to take it. Suppose it's not established. 
I don't know whether to take that vaccine or this not. This is a clinical trial, right? This is a clinical yeah. trial. These are trials. All are in trials. We can't. This is the problem. Yeah. During the trial period, they don't announce anything. Only regulators come to know about it. Yeah. When they give approval, then we have to choose. As you correctly yeah. said. No, no, I'm back at this time. At this time, which trial? You know, if you have access to, you are a patient and you are a subject, you know, which trial would you accept? You know, so, so safety-wise, you are saying that safety-wise, all of these drugs are safe at this point. Yeah, yeah, went, mRNA yeah. is also safe, but it's not yet, so far, no vaccine available. First time it is coming. So right. natural fear is there in that. Recombinant is well established. Yes. Uh, okay. yeah, I also, mRNA vaccine is faster to do, easy to do, low cost, and it has no virulence yes. problem. Yes. A lot of advantages are there. With, but with, I, but with, I also believe that uh, I, I think I, there won't be one vaccine which would just give you lifelong immunity. Knowing this no, virus, no, I think no, no, it yeah. would be repeated exposure. Look at influenza virus. We yeah. have had it for 100 years. We still <laughs> have to take it every day, every yeah, year. Yeah. Coronaviruses. Uh, uh, sir, it's going to be the same way. We probably every two years or something like that, but it won't be like one lifetime. You take it and you're done yeah. for it. Those yeah. that, that time is gone. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's correct. That's good. Okay. So one quick answer, you know, quick question. Transmission by asymptomatic people. How how risky is that? Asymptomatic people. Just a brief answer. Uh, I think there's been a lot of debate in the literature because the WHO initially said it's a common mode. But yeah. then again, came back and said that it's not a problem at all. But I think uh, it is a problem. Asymptomatic carriers do uh, spread the disease because it's difficult to distinguish between asymptomatic carriers and pre-symptomatic stage. That's a problem. And uh, in India, at least now we are going to see because the family spread seems to be through asymptomatic carriers. The only positive thing about it is if somebody is asymptomatic carrier, uh, the amount of uh, density of virus transmitted seems to be less than an infected person. So the child, person who's catching it seems to have less than what normally happens. And just briefly about the previous one, the only published uh, article on the vaccine has been in Lancet two weeks back from a Chinese company, Sinovac, uh, which has published their phase one plan showing safety and efficacy of the vaccine. Of course, like all Chinese data, I think people are starting to look at it critically, but that's the only published uh, article we have on the vaccine. I do want to point out for the asymptomatic, uh, the, just, just think of this way. The younger the age, more chances of, of the person having asymptomatic infection. And uh, the, the, as you age further, more chances of you having symptomatic, uh, symptomatic infection. Obviously, the bolus, the distance, and the age. So think of the tri triangle. The bolus of the virus, the, the age of the person, and the distance when you person who was coughing or, or sneezing or anything and how far you were away from it. These three things determine, but age helps people. Younger population does have a uh, high chance of having asymptomatic infection. And let one comment I'll make Adi. also. Let, let me give a light, uh, Adi. Him, yeah. Okay, let me give a lighthearted answer. Okay. Let's wait and see for next two weeks <laughs> how it. the 50,000 people in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who are asymptomatic that yeah. went there uh, and they were tested for uh, apparently for uh, temperature and see how the how it evolves. So that will be uh, epidemiological study within yeah, two right, weeks. Right. Yeah, and, already six of them got infected. So I think I think Trump is going to be for a rude awakening in that one. I feel like. Yeah. We'll yeah. see. I want to make one comment too, because yeah, um, okay. I think this is really important what you guys are talking about, because the WHO came out not too long ago saying there was no asymptomatic transmission. So I see this is the kind of information that starts to confuse people out there. And I really want to stress that, you know, that's that's inaccurate. We've actually, right, initially it was quoted at 18% and then it was quoted at 44%. And so while we don't exactly know the exact percentage, to think that you're not capable of transmitting it is spreading false information. And so the need for masking, which has been proven to be effective from spreading um, is really critical. So I just wanna underline that point. Yeah, I appreciate it. That's good, good comment. Yeah, um, so I think there are some more questions that we have. So at the last, you know, I think we are time-wise, we are not in a rush. I think we're all enthusiastic. So I want you all, all these faculty, you know, the speakers give, like a one sentence answer at the end, you know, at the end, each one give one sentence. What is the take home message today after the meeting? So in the meantime, let me ask one more question here. Um, the second surge in October or fall, 
what are your thoughts about second surge and what we should be doing about it uh, anyone the second surge uh, would not be as severe as we saw that in new york uh, it won't be as severe in anywhere else for for many reasons but from a epidemiology point of view if you look at the virus has already affected the easy host easy host means in the first time around people who are very easily susceptible the nursing home patient the elderly population diabetics obese who had more comorbidities the first time around it already got it secondly with the first infection you start building little bit of herd immunity so and thirdly people have learned a little bit more a lesson so they at least today are a little bit more is uh, uh, abiding to the to to the social distancing and other effects so general public starts to learn little bit about it so hopefully the second surge that will come will not be that severe we also know now to take care of the very sick people more more patients with with ARDS etc and hopefully if some other medications will be available by september why will it be more difficult to diagnose this condition because that in at least is also the time when the flu the general flu epidemic starts so for a primary care physician or physician in a community it will be very difficult anybody who has a little bit cough running nose and and this is it flu or is it covid so the workload of the physician primary care physician and the frontline workers is going to increase the severity of the disease the way it it hit new york and the way it hit uh, some parts of the uh, other uh, italy and other parts of the country would not be that much i think we already seen that we have learned how to take manage the icu patients better the mortality in the icu is stabilizing and and it is going down so that's a good news of this okay can yeah, nagi is there any comment on that or uh, no, yeah no, i, I think have, i agree with you. yeah okay yeah okay thanks and uh, nagi one more question from ga standpoint uh, you know the covid can cause diarrhea about 30% of patients can have diarrhea but what i understand is that uh, infectivity from the stool is low so is that your experience or uh, what, what, what yeah. do you think so when actually we started discovering that the stool has got this virus there was a belief that this could be a peak oral transmission but fortunately this has not been demonstrated in fact the only thing that we have seen is those patients who have gastrointestinal diseases have a more severe prognosis that is they tend to get more into severe cases of critical cases compared to those who don't have gastrointestinal disease yes. this may be partly because of the viral load which is more in these people we are not very sure but the transmission there is no evidence of a peak oral transmission but one very important thing that is coming up recently is that if we actually look at uh, sewage systems and start looking at the virus presence in this you can trace the epidemiology of this disease and just recently <coughs> It was found that in Italy, for example, that this virus was present even in November, December in the sewage, the water systems. So we yeah. check the water system. So this is becoming a very important uh, epidemiological tool for epidemiologists to look at the sewage systems to find out. But right now we don't have evidence that there is a peak oral transmission. But I think we have to be careful. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, so this uh, the question. Another question I have is. Uh, uh prem and uh, others the telehealth what are some of the creative and unique ways of using telehealth going forward i think prem and uh, nageshwar and uh, kavita at least three of them can answer and the others also can join so so what are the, some of the creative ways of going using the telehealth nageshwar pan nageshwar first <laughs> ah, okay 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 yeah Like so I, my my take on telly health is I'm very old fashioned. I think we still have to see our patients, feel them, and then we're actually looking just at the how a patient walks into your clinic. We can often make a diagnosis. Telly health is very limited way. Unfortunately, we don't have anything at this point of time. I think telly health uh, is going, to, in my opinion, at least in India, is going to last only till this pandemic. And once the pandemic goes off, telly health is going to slowly, except for remote areas with no no accessibility. we have been doing a lot of tele health in fact we created large vans to go into villages we even do endoscopy tele health get transmissions and all but in my opinion tele health is only a temporary phenomenon at present we have to see our patients only then i think the patient is satisfied the physician is satisfied in optimum therapy that's my take yeah. yeah. your comments yeah yeah uh, 
Can I read out, Prasad? Yeah, please. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the telehealth, just like uh, Dr. Nagesh already said, you know, we're all, you need to feel the patient, touch them to see their reaction, especially in my field of endocrinology, in spite of you seeing them, sometimes I can't even make a diagnosis. And by this telehealth looks like some kind of voodoo medicine temporarily at this time, you know, it, it has a role. Now, because of uh, this virus fear, it's fine. That I'm not denying there's a role. Uh, I think it's a, we have to see our patients. You, know, you just can't do by uh, phone. And even by seeing, I sent a lot of patients with all kinds of symptoms, hormonal effects, and all kinds of stuff. And the, you can't make a diagnosis in these kind of guys. Anyway, yeah. that's my opinion. Yeah, so, yeah, Prem, so I, Dr. Kavita, yeah, I have a... <laughs> I have a, a, a sort of a contrary opinion, I think, yeah. to, to that. So, um, you know, access to healthcare is a huge piece of this. Um, and so the ability to do group visits, the ability to reach people who normally have difficulty with transportation, um, it's, a, it's really actually critical. Um, and while it's very, I'm not negating that you, you have to see the person for the right physical exam, the right illness, there's a lot of follow-up care that happens in between seeing people that can be done through telemedicine. Um, and the right technology is very important to being able to communicate well. Um, the other piece of that is that, you know, there are, we've actually seen no-show rates going down, productivity going up, and the ability to actually help people with their medications, their environment, their health education. Um, so it's not going anywhere. In fact, it's something that our patients are quite happy with in, in the VA system. Um, so maybe with time, it's it's a technology people will grow to use more. Okay, um, my my comments on that. Oh, something else came. Could everybody everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Hear. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So my my comment, I agree with uh, Dr. Kavita uh, because my daughter Kavita and <laughs> Ananda Sunny are gung ho about this um, uh, uh, telemedicine. Uh, the rationale is somewhat strange. <laughs> okay, first of all, you get paid now in America. Okay, we weren't getting paid for telemedicine before. And surprisingly, it's equal payment. It's the same as you were to, to see yeah. the patient. So, so, so like um, Kavita said, you know, it, there'll be in the primary care setting, especially the two, two aspects of it. With the primary care, uh, especially now, uh, it's very difficult to see the patients and volumes plummeted uh, uh, in physician offices. So one, for keeping your overhead costs, the only way you could do that is through telehealth and, and getting paid. So it's good medicine and good reimbursement. Um, the other aspect also, uh, leaving alone primary health, the telemedicine that we are um, promoting all across our hospitals um, is mainly in neurology and uh, uh, psychiatry, okay? In neurology, it's very hard to get a neurologist in a community hospital of uh, you know, 100 beds, uh, especially when the hospital is isolated. And what is happening is that, that um, the EMS or paramedics do not want to take you to the hospital that doesn't have a stroke and you end up losing all those patients even though it is farther away so it is not good medicine uh, except for uh, uh, the way that uh, stroke centers have promoted themselves as those panacea um, so uh, so for uh, um, hospitals uh, telemedicine has become a book boom and like Kavita said about VA, we do um, two hospitals. We do a lot of uh, uh, prison uh, uh, patients. Uh, and that is so helpful in prison patients because to bring a prisoner to a hospital, you need two guards. And uh, so they have to load up at 5 o'clock in the morning, even though the appointment is at 11 o'clock because they come and sit there and they charge hours. They're very expensive. So for prison systems, telemedicine is a wonderful cure. And so, but this is a catch. 
as we go along, many things are going to change forever after COVID. <clears throat> but I don't believe that we'll be shaking hands very soon. Okay? And it may become uh, 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 you know, something that, for, that will last in our culture uh, that we may not be shaking hands. You know, the same way we would be, may not be celebrating uh, like uh, Indian weddings where we have a thousand people <laughs> in a packed yeah. room. Maybe, yeah. maybe certain things are going to change forever. And yeah. telemedicine is something that's going to change forever. Uh, and, and the medicine is going to go uh, uh, because, um, because there was no payment before. It was all free service. Now there is a payment and it's a good medicine. And yeah. many of them have no access or affordability to come to physician offices, especially the poorer people and who happen to be more sicker. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mohan. Yeah. Uh, uh, as you said, Mohan Malam, I've been practicing uh, near Los Angeles area, internal medicine and uh, geriatrics since 1987. So this uh, health uh, business has, is getting more and more uh, popular recently, as Dr. Uh, said correctly. Yeah. That, Allowed to do the telehealth now, the patient is happy, and you know because of the transportation issues, especially the senior population, they allowed to have the, some kind of treatment from their homes type of thing from the doctor's office. And uh, about fifty to sixty percent of our practice, I practice internal medicine, geriatric solo practice, yeah. practice, and fifty to sixty percent of our practice now is on telehealth. Yes. So we start with on the phone, and if you need to then examine the patient, then we switch over to the video conferencing thing. And fortunately, as Dr. Premadigar just said, the government has recognized the importance of telehealth and started right. reimbursing. And not only that, they reimburse the same amount as the telephone visit versus the in-person visit. So now the, you know, more and more telehealth is getting more and more popular, I think. Is going to yeah. stay only if there are some uh, exceptions, you know, for example, surgeons. Of course, they cannot do the surgery on the phone. So, surgeons' business might go down if you, you know, the yeah. thing. And another thing is that, uh, <clears throat> you know, this uh, malpractice insurance carriers, they started uh, covering our uh, malpractice insurance at least until the COVID uh, uh, crisis is over. And after that, probably. You know the water uh, premiums might uh, go up. Yeah. So telehealth is there going to stay? And it yeah, I think so. I think you're right. Telehealth is going to stay. It's not going to be. Yeah. I mean, I should not say empty, but yeah. 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 Telehealth is going to stay. I I personally feel that it's going to stay. And also, I'm personally betting on telehealth. You know, like inflammatory bowel disease, for example. They don't get a good care. So I'm trying to focus on that. You know, inflammatory bowel disease, there are only a handful of experts in a given region. So we can direct it to them. So I think I think telehealth is going to stay. Okay, with the, because of lack the of... Color color. Has a comment. Yeah, I just want to say that I, I think the genie is out of the bottle. Uh, as the medicine is evolving, yeah. telehealth will be there. Uh, where it, it lacks is uh, there should be reimbursement for group therapy from support group for rehab for those kind of things which can be done at in a safe place from the physician's office or, or from the healthcare providers. As the medicine evolves, telehealth is not going to go away. This is Absolutely. the new way. Just, just, we just get used to it. We probably like yeah. how to feel the patient, but it's not happening anymore. Yeah, you may have a spot. Just one quick uh, comment. Uh, the yeah. government, okay, go ahead. The US go ahead. government has recognized the importance of telehealth. That yeah. they added a lot of uh, course that could be done on the telephone to, to telehealth. Like for example, in the hospitals, you can even deal, do telehealth on critical care patients also, as well as yeah. the rounds, distance summaries, and all that. And the government yeah. has added a lot of new codes to promote yeah, the right. and also transmission of disease will be less. Transmission yeah. of disease also will be less. Yeah. But the lawsuits yeah. will increase. But the lawsuits <laughs> will increase. Just be careful because yeah, yeah. It, won't you, it won't replace. Thank you. Uh, it won't replace. Yeah, sorry. Thank you very much, Professor. Okay, five minutes from you have to leave. Main important part of 
ఆరోగ్యమే మహాభాగ్యం లెట్ ది రూలర్స్ రియలైజ్ దిస్ అండ్ లెట్ దెమ్ బి ప్రాంప్ట్ ఆన్ హెల్త్ ఇష్యూస్ అండ్ ఎడ్యుకేషన్ దే ఆర్ టూ వెరీ ఇంపార్టెంట్ ఆస్పెక్ట్స్ ఇన్ ఎనీ కంట్రీ and they are unnecessarily giving lot of importance to defense which is not right okay i think all of you are educated you should put some pressure on the governments and yeah. they should allocate more funds for health research science and that the way we have to protect ourselves dharma raksha rakshita thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you very much professor sir dear namaskaram namaskar prem reddy garu namaskaram prem prem yeah okay namaskar andarki namaskaram i take it yeah okay thank you so uh, before uh, everybody has a statement to make uh, can uh, mohan malam chairman of uh, nata foundation or nata uh, of uh, not foundation but advisory council can you give a brief uh, you know brief vote of thanks oh uh, what is thanks just uh, you know the on behalf of the organizing team for this webinar i would like to thank first of all the prime initiator of this event dr arsh shardigar from alabama thank you thank you mohan and uh, thanks to dr premendra garu dr nagesh shardigar dr varun prasad digar dr kiran patel and dr jeet dipsal gar in spite of the busy schedules they participated in this webinar kavita uh, as and the community on this new disease which has a lot of uncertainties yeah సీన్ <laughs> to make this event a lively one because there is a believe it or not there is a lot of information technology involved here this kind of uh, meetings as you all know and with your help this webinar would not be would not have been possible and dr suresh suresh reddy our special thanks to you although he's not in the audience here dr suresh is uh, probably the busiest <laughs> nowadays we are among all of us in spite of that he joined and uh, contributed to this and uh, <clears throat> before i conclude i just want to have one announcement that nata is currently organizing uh, several virtual events competitions such as uh, miss usa mrs usa fashion show beauty pageants cultural competitions etc etc super singer sir there yeah, is some entertainment after this and then uh, hopefully we will uh, get through this uh, unexpected uh, covid-19 crisis asap thank you okay yeah thank you mohan thank you very much yeah thank you so we'll have the final comment nata website nataes.org they got a series of uh, entertainment events uh, posted on that okay that's all uh, as usual yeah thank you thank you so we'll have a final comment you know like one or two sentences not long not more than two sentences so let's start in the same order then the we can start first and then we'll go with nagi and we'll go like that so, so go ahead one final final parting comment who is next me i'm the next yeah okay. I, i i don't have a a, a comment except you know appreciate uh you know so many brilliant people uh taking time um and dr talwar if i get uh, covid i will call you as a doctor <laughs> <laughs> that's what i was thinking <laughs> yeah. i have personal experience of the disease so you can call me anytime no. <laughs> right right thank you uh, for your uh, participation and you, i don't know whether you know it or not every brother than you and kiran are ready guys you know <laughs> Every one of us are ready you know we all come from one place like patels uh, i don't know there are many uh, but i want to tell you i speak five indian languages okay <laughs> not telugu i would suppose right 
Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Appreciate uh, yeah. everybody's coming. Okay. And, no, Nagesh already taking. Uh, you know, he's a busy, busy gastroenterologist, but he's sitting very patiently. I'm not even shaking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And your father was my examiner. And one day, in a light-hearted moment, I'll tell you how my oral exam went with you. <laughs> <laughs> it can be told openly. That's why. <laughs> uh, we we have some stories to tell also. <laughs> positive. He was the actual examiner to all of us. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Us, but they're all positive. Yeah. 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 That's right. Okay, Nagi, you have parting comments. Take home message for this, and I think my comment would be that I think uh, we realized with this pandemic that. Uh, Preventive health is extremely important. To stay healthy and then you are healthy in spite of whatever happens. This is extremely important. And we also realized not to stigmatize this disease because that's the most important problem. To stay optimistic, we are sure that this is going to be a small blink in the history as we look along and that we'll get over all this. And to stay on route, optimistic would be very important. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So who is next, to Dr. Talwar? I'll say two sentences in two different languages. This is a disease which is a blip on the future evolution of our thoughts. It will go away and human mankind will win. But I want to say the other one in Sanskrit for everybody. It is the core of Ayurveda, which is first swasta rakshanam, atiraksha vichar prashmanam, means take care of the healthy, but protect and relieve the ailing of people's suffering. And that's why we're in this business and let's keep doing this. This disease will go away, another one will come. But we, <laughs> we all have to be optimistic. Thanks. Thank you. So next is uh, Kavita, right? Kavita. Okay, yeah. So uh, that was beautiful, Dr. Thalwar. I like that very much. Uh, I, you know, I think this pandemic represents a huge opportunity for healthcare and social reform. And, you know, let us not lose sight of the power that we have to make those changes and affect future generations. Uh, so despite what's happening, I have a high degree of optimism for our way forward. Dr. Prasad? Oh, no. Uh, just like Dr. Kavita said, there is a lot of opportunities with this uh, realignment of uh, COVID, what she did. So I'm always out of the box guy. So they, there's a lot of opportunities available. And as far as my branch is concerned uh, in diabetics, uh, please be careful. And most of you are probably about 50 or 60 and they have comorbid conditions. You use the social distancing wash your hands and be active, take care of blood sugars, and because we are at a little higher risk. Other than that, this, this shall pass and uh, we'll definitely win this uh, COVID the war also. Yes. Okay, I, I'll throw my two cents also. You know, this COVID is going to go away one day, and, uh, but the life is going to change. It's not going to be exactly the same. But it probably come back. We will probably not this way, but in between, we'll meet somewhere halfway, I think. So there may be some opportunities that uh, that come out of the learning curve with, during this uh, epidemic, and we need to learn those opportunities and uh, and use entrepreneurial spirit to use these opportunities uh, to this learning to help the mankind. Uh, I feel like there are opportunities in this uh, bad epidemic. And learning, you know, about improving the health, like sleep and uh, obesity, all those things. So, so I think some positive things come come certainly will come out of this pandemic. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say one. Thing. I'm ready. I'm ready. Let him speak on. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, I love them. Yeah. I'm ready. We are keep saying that uh, thanks to the healthcare professionals and all. So, doctors are God sent. Uh, in uh, like the uh, god sent uh, god gifted okay so we are fortunate to have doctors like you and nata is really proud of you and uh, thanks uh, being in this uh, like great profession and uh, helping all the patients 
not only in this one but this covid reminded about the doctors and how important <clears throat> those doctors are and you you are doing thankless job and especially premanna and uh, everybody uh, dr varuprasad reddy garu dr nagesh reddy garu padma bhushans so we are excited to see all of you prasad ji reddy garu kavita reddy garu and dr talwar and dr uh, kiran patel everybody who are participated we are really grateful and thank you all of you <clears throat> thank you darbar uh, thank you after thanks so uh, anybody else raghav reddy raghav on mute lo on me on me mute lo on on mute so i have one person everybody wants to hear one thing when that vaccination is going to come everybody is going to ask them which month how much time it takes that's what everybody wants to hear when i talk to everybody like all of the people asking one question when it's going to come what month it's a good question good question and we are all waiting we are all anxiously waiting and one more qu- one more question to dr thalwar so there is a autopsy findings in china and europe and here what are the autopsy findings dr thalwar Are you talking about autopsy of the lung or autopsy of the kidney? The autopsy in the lung actually shows the fibrosis and those patients who survive severe infection. Mild infection, there is no damage to the lung. So think of this, 81% of the population, those 81% of the people who get the disease are not going to have any residual damage. They are fine. These are the ones we want them to recover at home. Very good. Then another... 15% of people get a moderate disease in which they may need to come to the hospital and get admitted most of them if they have no underlying major diabetes no underlying uncontrolled hypertension they have no underlying immunosuppressive disease like they are taking cancer treatment something like that they will also recover 1 to 3% patients in different uh, different studies are going to le- be left with damage to their lung to their kidney and even to other areas of the body or maybe stroke or encephalopathy it means they can't really think they they they, they say, say something has happened that even after recovering i'm not the same person so the autopsy findings are showing glomerular damage in the kidney so people are developing renal failure they're showing fibrosis in the lungs so that patients then even when they recover they are short of breath they may even be left with having to walk around with oxygen in the brain itself there is small vessel blockages something like strokes that you get so some of these people then come out and, and even though they've been they've gotten better but the changes in the brain autopsy have shown that the small vessels which are in the brain we call that small vessel vasculitis that has occurred so even with the severe disease even when the patient recovers it's not the same but that's a very small percentage of patients let's not be afraid of this disease most people will recover and have, will not have damage that's the only thing is recovery time as the disease severity is a little bit more the recovery time is a little bit more the usual flu you get better within 10 days a moderate uh, covid virus infection takes at least 8 to 12 weeks to fully recover and that's something that we've been telling our patients and and t- helping them as well i hope i answered your question what about dac changes in lungs the 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 changes in the lung that that they have seen with the endothelial damage which shows small vessel thrombosis and the fibrosis once it is sets in it has its own course and it will slowly continue that's where the dexamethasone and the anticoagulation is is helpful so that continues and that's with our worry so a lot of people asking dr talwar for well, a simple question what yeah. is the treatment protocol in usa for for, for treatment okay the outpatient treatment let me quickly tell you if there are physicians in this group and you really want to know this follow the crp follow the d dimer and follow the serum ferritin crp is a very short half life ferritin has a little longer half life and d dimers somehow predict the development of vasculopathy means development of thrombosis in the uh, dvts pulmonary embolism strokes etc so once the patient gets discharged 
if his crp should be normal his peritin should be should come down to normal and d dimer should also come down to normal if that it is doesn't come down you need to anticoagulate that patient for at least 30 to 40 days you can use coumadin you can do you, you can use no accident, newer uh, oral anticoagulants, whatever it is, because that is going to stop the, the prevention of the development of the, these things. The other thing is those patients who are symptomatic, even with mild cough or shortness of breath and et cetera, you can still use prednisone in those patients as well. And please, outpatient medicine, use prednisone in these patients, low dose prednisone, it'll help them. It'll help with their symptomatic relief. It'll help with their fatigue, et cetera, et cetera. And third thing is rehab teach them breathing diaphragmatic exercises. We all breathe, but we usually use our chest. Try to use your diaphragm. Take a deep breath in and let the abdomen go out Then breathe out and let the abdomen go in. This is the diaphragmatic breathing. And that helps to decrease the atelectasis both during COVID and after COVID. These are the few things that I'm telling my patients. I do agree with vitamin D and vitamin C as Dr. Nageshwar Rao also pointed out in our patient, vitamin D is deficient in Indians. And that we believe is one of the reasons why so many Indians get this. I also, the AAS receptor two density is higher in Indians, even when we are thin. So we don't, that's why thin diabetics in India are thin diabetics who are here are also getting the COVID infection because the receptor density is higher in those patients. Okay. Thank you. Well, what about zinc? What, Dr. I know we have a lot of questions, but uh, Dr. Talbar, about zinc, do you have any comment on zinc? This, this, <laughs> he said that before. He said yes. zinc is helpful. Zinc, vitamin C, and vitamin D. Okay, but you take a hyper, a hyper dose when, uh, when you get to, to try to become sick, or you just, what, do you, what kind of dosage do you take? <laughs> zinc supplements. Okay. Go ahead, Dr. Rao. There are no randomized studies with zinc. But uh, the basic pathophysiology is that zinc actually inhibits the virus from entering into the cells. And it's been shown that zinc, when combined with antiviral drugs, is more potent. This is based on uh, cell studies. We don't have really randomized studies. It's very difficult to do that with zinc. What is advocated is 50 milligrams every day. So this is a dose that's advocated. But I said it's very difficult to prove it in clinical studies. But because zinc is harmless, people say, why not anyway take it? But short, short term, it should be okay to take higher. Yeah, short term. Yeah. Yes, yeah. zinc has been proven to be helpful in a uh, common cold, and that's why it's available uh, in CVS. And you yeah. can see that the same thing, the zinc tablet. Yeah, uh, viral, viral infections. Viral, yeah. viral, common cold, viral infections, rhinovirus yeah. infections. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then any other comments or any other thoughts or anything? Otherwise, we can conclude. I guess we can. I think we're done. Thank okay. you all. Have thank a you. happy Father's Day tomorrow, guys. Yeah. Happy Father's thank you, Prem. Yeah, thank you, Nagi. Thank you. Yeah. All. yeah, thank you, all the speakers. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks for your time and uh, it's really Have valuable you. information. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.